So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the PWI On Track for a Safer Railway Seminar. My name is Joan Heary, Engineering Director for ACOM and past President of the PWI. On behalf of the PWI London section, it is my absolute pleasure to act as chair today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, Bulker Rail and TrackSure, both of whom will be presenting today. So before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Just advising all attendees that you have arrived muted by default. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers. These have been scheduled in after the majority of the presentations. Given time constraints, we do have two sponsor presentations where time for questions has not been allocated. However, if you have any questions for these spots, by all means submit them and the presenters will respond to you individually. I will remind you as we get to these particular presentations. To ask questions, please use the question functionality. This can be done at any point during the presentations. You do not have to wait for the question and answers sessions at the end. The conference will be recorded and the recording and the slides will be made avail available on the PWI website shortly. Audience polling will also be used throughout the conference and we will be having a break at 14.25 for 15 minutes. So let's have a look at the agenda now, please. Um, I guess just before, before I, I launch into this, we, um, I heard this morning that very sadly, Network Rail had a fatality yesterday. Um, and it's very timely that we're having this, this seminar today because it just reminds us that you can never, ever, ever be complacent about safety. So there's a, you know, a person yesterday who's lost their life. A family have been left bereaved and, um, and it will have lasting impact on the friends and colleagues of the individual involved. I don't know any more detail um, at this present time, and I'm sure it will all come out in the fullness of time, but it just reminds us that we can never, ever, ever be complacent about safety. So we know that safety on the railway is at the forefront of everything we do. It is the personal responsibility of every individual working on and interacting with the railway. The PWI, as an engineering institution, takes the subject very seriously. Our code of professional conduct requires all our members to have an overriding responsibility for the public good, including the health, safety and well-being of present and future generations. Every day, industry strives to make improvements in safety. We will probably never reach a position of utopia. And that is why events like this are so important. One of the ways in which people learn and gain knowledge is by listening to the experience of others. We have a very full agenda today with speakers from across the rail community, including Network Rail, the supply chain and industry bodies. We will be starting with a keynote address from Nick Millington. And without further ado, I will make the introduction. So just to welcome Nick. So Nick has worked in the industry for 30 years. He started as an apprentice mechanical and electrical engineer at 16. He is a chartered civil engineer, a chartered project manager, and a chartered permanent way engineer, and a fellow of both the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Permanent Way Institution. Nick has undertaken a number of roles at all levels in asset management, plant, projects and maintenance, up to infrastructure projects director and route infrastructure maintenance director. Nick is currently leading the Network Rail Safety Task Force which is focused on modernising our approach to maintaining our railway in an effort to significantly reduce the risk of track workers being struck by a train. He is also currently the Deputy President of the Permanent Way Institution. Over to you, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Jane, for those kind words. And um, I'm not going to comment about the events of last night. Um, there is an investigation underway and obviously it's very early days and we don't understand at this point um, clearly what happened at Eastleigh. 
last night and that will come out in the wash uh, when there are facts that we can share. So anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about um, how you can reduce risk to track workers and what we've done in the last uh, just just over 12 months uh, to, to do that right across the, uh, the UK rail network. So hopefully if I press the button, my slides will move on. Bear with me. There we go. So yeah, I'm Nick Millington. Um, Jones uh, introduced me, so I won't do that again. Um, nice to, to be here. Um, and it's uh, also nice to be um, heading towards the end of uh, a lockdown uh, towards whatever tier that you're in, but hopefully it'll bring you uh, to a, a, a nice Christmas time. So um, the, the Safety Task Force was formed last year um, after the very sad events of um, Margam. Um, in July of last year, um, both Spike and Gareth doing um, fairly mundane maintenance activities were struck and killed in South Wales. And immediately after that sad event, uh, Network Rail was served with, a, um, with two improvement notices. Now, those notices predated um, the Margam event, but I dare say that the, um, the immediacy of what happened at Margam um, meant that we were served the notices um, shortly after. I certainly saw drafts of the notices before Margam uh, myself, so I know that to be true. Um, also, and, and subsequently to, uh, to Margam, Aidan was sadly struck and killed at Road in Northamptonshire in, in April of this year. And it just goes to show that literally a split second change, a split second distract, uh, distraction can cause um, very dramatic consequences. And um, we are able to um, reduce risk across our railway network. In fact, we must do that, and it's possible to do it. Uh, and I would urge you all to um, just to think really long and hard um, about the things that you do. Do you actually need to do them? If you do need to do them, are there better ways of doing them, uh, lower risk ways of doing them? And how do you keep, um, if you put people to work on the railway, the presence of mind at all times to keep yourself and the teams that you work with or for or a, as a part of safe at all times? So we were served with two notices. They're wide ranging notices um, and that they require us to improve the planning of work on railway infrastructure and also um, the technology that we use to keep track workers safe. Um, we have, there are 12 specific compliance criteria with the, the two notices and we had a collaborative discussion with all of our 13 routes. There are only eight at the time, but there are 13 now. Uh, but we, we agreed on 12 criteria that we felt in network rail would address the compliance criteria. We had meaningful dialogue with the ORR and we agreed that these criteria will now uh, serve to be the compliance criteria for the notices. Um, as with any big um, undertaking on the railway, it takes time. Now, um, initially when these notices were served, they had, they had a compliance date of July 2021. Now with access planning timescales, um, the, um, within four weeks of the notices being served, the, the engineering access statement for 2021, we we're in deep dialogue with our train operator customers. And in order to reduce the risk effectively, one of the things, one of a number of things, but one of the things that was quite important was to make sure we get the right possession access um, discussed, agreed and published. And the, the engineering access statement for um, 2022 is, in, is underway now. Um, and um, that the, the, the statement or the, um, applications in that statement opened in September of this year and therefore um, working with our regulatory colleagues they agreed that it was fair to give us a compliance date of July 22. Now I know I've had a number of questions in previous presentations um, that have been, been along the lines of um, do you think that um, 2022 is too long and it's really important that we don't shift the risk. It's, it, we, it, the, the, this is a very complicated activity where we are looking at 28 million interventions that we do each year and it's really important that we don't put um, risk into infrastructure compliance or it's really important that we don't put risk into a signalist location so it's a really steady and meaningful migration to a safer place without transferring risk so um, before anyone asks me a question about the date of 2022 uh, I think I've just given you the answer straight away uh, as to why it's really important that we do it in a very structured manner. So the importance of data um, in order to reduce risk, 
I can't express how important it is um, to understand factually um, where your risks are. I must have heard virtually every sweeping generalism and anecdote in the railway book, um, although it wouldn't surprise me if I hear more in the future. Um, but it's really important that we base everything that we do on tangible fact. And there were some uh, omissions from tangible fact. So I've, um, I've set about creating the right information so that we can make the right risk-based decisions right across the country. The graph in front of you now shows um, near miss data and you can see up until so the fifth bar along you can see that the um in it the, there's some swathes of orange and that's near misses due to lookout protection but the one um the color that troubled me was the yellow and the and yellow means that we haven't defined the course so i've spent a lot of time with our routes and regions making sure that the the entries into the SMIS database give us a very clear picture as to what has happened and why so that we can then analyze um, what, the, what is it that we need to do to reduce the risk and then also make sure that we don't transfer the risk elsewhere with operational close calls and I continue that journey now and we, we, we carry out more analysis and we work, we've worked with the RSSB and, um, and others to make sure that we get really really good credible um, data and analysis with which to base our change decisions. This is another piece of analysis that, um, that we've done as well and, and this basically is um, a, a plot that shows operational close calls, which you could argue are a precedent to a near miss and also near misses. And they're plotted by period and by day of the week and by time of the day. And it was it became very clear that um, um, we, have, we had some specifically high risk times of the day in the week. So you can see uh, in the morning, so Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, you can see there's a peak of operational close calls and near misses. And incidentally, they are the times of the day and week that Margam happened and rode. And you can also see that um, in the middle of the night, we get a, um, a surge in operational close calls. And that is gen generally down to um, protection and marker boards being placed on wrong lines. And that's given us another, um, a, you know, a line of um, risk reduction. So it's really this this pictorial data is really helpful in, in terms of influencing changes of behaviours in in organisations or depots that have got um, very deeply entrenched habits. So I've taken the lookout, sorry, the um, near miss data even further, and we're doing that now with um, operational close calls. And what we've done is further uh, plotted and track, uh, we track near misses by causation. So you can see here as a, for instance, um, unassisted lookout working it, and it, unassisted lookout working, make no doubt about it, is number one in my site of risk reduction. 53% um, of all near misses occur with unassisted lookouts, and just a smidgen over 10% of all railway work is done with lookouts. So it's clear that we focus, you know, that there is a, a real need to focus there first. But you can also see um, the risk um, related to line speed. And when you actually think about it, um, unassisted lookouts and higher speed railways, um, the risk is obvious. Um, but sometimes it takes a chart or a trend to make that very clear to, um, to us engineering folk. But you can choose to do something different. Um, there, I've lost count of the amount of times I've walked in, you know, certainly in the last 12 months, but in my time as head of maintenance before that and um, in infrastructure projects where there is a habit of our frontline track staff where they believe working with a flag is safer. It isn't. And we've got to challenge it in a robust and uh, compassionate way, but provide meaningful alternatives to reduce the risk with technology or with um, different uh, planning opportunities to, to, to access the railway at safer times. So the, the notices, the 12 criteria, the two notices are planning and technology. We've got a comprehensive program of work to um, reduce risk uh, and uh, the majority of the work we've done so far is in maintenance. It's not solely in maintenance, <clears throat> but the near miss uh, analysis, uh, was, it was very clear that um, that was the first place that we must look. And um, so over the last 12 months, we put together a comprehensive programme of reducing risk in, um, in maintenance. I, I mentioned that there were 28 million maintenance activities and um, we are reviewing and we are required to review each of the 28 million tasks in an effort to 
uh, eliminate the need to do the task in the first place. So the first rule of um, risk prevention is not do it, obviously, providing you don't, um, providing you've got a better way of, um, of maintaining your assets. Uh, we've got things like PLPR, uh, plain line pattern recognition, and we've got technology, intelligent infrastructure that can mean that we could, you know, that means that we can take um, human beings off the track. Um, so basically, um, this is a work breakdown structure slide, and you can see that we're doing comprehensive work bank reviews, and we're looking to eliminate tasks. So we've eliminated 600,000 tasks so far, and we're about 25 to 30 percent of the way through that very deep um, maintenance work bank review. We're also looking at times of the day and days of the week where there are there is additional capacity in the in the, um, in the line block plan. There are times of the day and days of the week where signals are very busy and that gives rise to operational close calls. We want to make sure that we de-risk that time of the, uh, the week and the day and we transfer where possible and with um, rescheduling of tasks and rosters um, work to safer times of the day or days of the week. Um, there's another piece of work there about improving data. We've now get comprehensive data on line blockage activity. This time last year, I had no information on line blockage activity. Um, and we've, um, for, for each of the periods of this calendar year, I'm really pleased to say that um, from the 700 signal workstations, I'm now getting typically 95% returns on, um, on line blockages. And it's really clear now, we can see um, that we take somewhere between 20 and 25,000 line blocks every four weeks and we are um, slowly creeping up with additional protection to protect those line blockages um, so that um, it reduces the risk of a signal error and a train ending up in a line blockage. So that's, that's another piece of work we're doing. Then we're improving um, our approach to safe system of work planning, and we're also deploying technology such as remote TCODs, SATWAS, and other things to, um, to make sure that we protect track workers in a way that eliminates human error. So those are the five main key headline areas that we're working at the moment. There are other areas, but they're the main ones. We've, um, we've taken the, the 12 compliance criteria and we've issued um, collaboratively with all of our routes a specification document where each route needs to reach in order to comply with the notices. Now, compliance is one thing, but also what it will do is it will, um, if we get this right, if they put the right leading interventions in, the right lagging intervention should happen. So reduction in near misses and a reduction in, um, in track workers uh, put at risk of being struck by a train. We're up to version three of this document in a little over 12 months, and it's 43 pages, and each of the routes um, have signed up at route director, head of planning, head of operations, head of maintenance levels. And uh, we use this as a, a structure to base our program, our evidence collection, and, um, and how we um, track our five and a half thousand milestones of work that we've got to do between now, or sorry, between last year and the compliance date, which is July 2022. Each of the routes uh, of the 13 routes um, has got a maturity measure, so we track their progress. Um, some of it's numeric and some of it's subjective uh, based on conversations and assurance type conversations. So we're able to track each route's position. This was a this was from January early this year, and what we've been able to very pleasingly say is that each route is improving, um, and I can show you um, some of the other ways that we're tracking that as well. But we have meaningful, mature um, dialogue on um, on all aspects of, for instance, planning, safe access, technology, operations, assurance, um, the integrity of their programmes, and, um, and and also um, the work bank reviews. So that's um, that, that's. Uh, uh, something that we repeat and measure every three months, um, as well as other kind of things in, the, in our program and KPIs that we measure as well. Bear with me, hopefully that will uh, move on. Another slide. There we go. Oh, too far. There we go. Right, so our it, it's communication with our frontline and engagement is absolutely vitally important. And it's I can't give them a 43 page document and ask them to digest it and do something about that. So we've got three strap lines. Um, I didn't copy Boris about um, stay at home, save lives, all that kind of stuff. Um, however, I have got no more lookouts. We are going to we're going to um, we've, we've reduced um, lookout working in the last 12 months, but we're looking to eliminate it in the next 18 months. Indeed, each route and region has now put a date on that, which is uh, uh, I, I welcome because it focuses the mind. 
We're also um, going to stop open line working without additional protection. So we're going to deploy technology, be it satellite systems or um, um, or tower systems, but also make sure that line blockages have got additional protection. And also, um, we're going to um, uh, we're going to we're in pursuit of 100% compliance to standard 019. Uh, and most of you will know what standard 019 is. Um, it, it's the um, it's the standard with which we um, uh, plan and, and manage the interventions and the, and the visits to site to do work and it's got a hierarchy of risk controls uh, for, for operational risk and it's really important that um, that we uh, adhere to uh, that standard and work as safely as we reasonably uh, um, possibly can. So the number one target, eliminate lookout, there we go, um, dates from um, a time when railways were a lot slower um, but obviously now we've got a, um, a railway that's much more frequently used and at much higher speeds. Um, like I said, it's the number one cause of um, near misses. So to all of you who put people to work um, on, on network rail, I would suggest you look at alternatives. There are um, gaps in the line blockage plan. There are possessions that you can apply for and uh, create new in 2022, or indeed uh, ones that are in the plan already. You can seek permission to work inside those. Um, but I'd suggest that you, um, that you uh, phase out your plans to work with Lookout. Um, this time last year, um, on average, we were uh, delivering 1 million work orders a year uh, with, with um, unassisted Lookout protection. And since last year, this slide says 50% when I created the presentation, I'm pleased to say that we're at 55% reduction now in unassisted Lookout working, but we still got quite a lot to do to eliminate that figure. So um, we've made significant reductions that's, most of those reductions have been made through um, more proactivity in planning, more um, interventions uh, and challenge from our managers and our leaders, um, and, and also um, um, what we've been able to do as well is modernise a number of tasks so that we don't put human beings on the track, we use technology to do it. So there's a blend of ways that we're, we are utilising to reduce um, unassisted lookout working. Um, you can see in the little map which routes have made significant reductions. So certainly Scotland doesn't, you can't work with lookouts in Scotland anyway, but um, you can see that um, vast swathes of Wales, Western, Sussex, Eastern region have made significant reductions in lookout working uh, to a point where it's virtually non-existent in a number of those routes already. And uh, there are plans obviously for the Liverpool area, Northwest and Central, Anglia, and some of the other routes like Wessex are just about to ramp up on their reductions as well. So it's important that we do that sustainably. Um, you can see the blue line in this graph is the reduction in unassisted lookout work orders. And you can see that when Margam happened, which was approximately um, um, week 15, 14 of, um, of last year, you can see that the blue line, which is unassisted lookout working, um, makes a, a very um, marked change in trend. And you can see the 20,000 work orders a week that we were doing, uh, we are now below 10,000 work orders a week and we are tracking well below 10,000 work orders a week uh, at present. It's really important also that we don't transfer the risk into the infrastructure. And you can see during the first few months of the task force, I was concerned and you, you, know, you can relate, the, the red line is overdue work in the plan. And we, we were tracking overdue work climbing and it obviously, um, it, it, as a trend, it, it, it does climb over Christmas, but we rapidly recover it in the new year. Um, I'm pleased to say that compliance hasn't been adversely affected. And in the first 13 weeks, we observed uh, an increase in overdue work. But once that those 13 week rosters kicked in and, and the rescheduling all then lined up, um, you can see that through um, this year, between week 39 and about week 14, uh, we made some really significant reductions in unassisted lookout working, um, and also that the um, the COVID um, crisis has not adversely impacted us um, in terms of keeping the work bank at a very sustainable level, uh, which is um, keeping obviously overdue work orders as low as possible. Bear with me, hopefully that will work. Uh... Oh, sorry. Right, so line blockages are an important um, part of how we do work. We do about 50% of our maintenance work during the day. Uh, we're not no longer going to be able to use a lookout <clears throat> after next year. And therefore, line blocks uh, become an important part of how we deliver our work. 
So we've had to develop um, a, a, a good data set and a good understanding with line blockages. So you can see um, that um, basically from a standing start of period 11, which is January this year, uh, we've built up a robust set of returns. In period eight, just gone, we're at 91%. So um, you can see that we've gone from nothing to a very robust data collection exercise from 700 signal workstations. And we've now got a very good um, idea of what happens in line blocks, which ones have got additional protection, which ones haven't, all that kind of stuff. And then we can plan how do we, um, which tasks do we put into line blocks? And also um, what technology can we use to additionally protect line blockages in various areas? And we've got a very uh, comprehensive plan to, um, to increase uh, the additional protection now based on this um, fact-based data. Um, we've also done a full assessment of signal workload and you can see um, this heat map in this graph here. This is one of the transfer risks that I'm, I'm very concerned about so I've got to be very careful not to do this. You can see the heat map in the um, in the middle of the right hand side here, you can see that signal workload when assessed is extremely busy on midweek mornings, exactly when we plan a lot of work, exactly when we see near misses, exactly when we see operational close calls. Now the heat map is a, is a montage of all, um, of, of, of all workstations. We're able to break this down by each individual workstation, but we're able to use this as a very clear, um, presentation to to our teams that if you are planning to take a risk at certain times of the day of the, of the week you must not do that you must reschedule your tasks you must re um, um, re roster your people where inside the terms and conditions and the flexibilities that we've got and you must plan to do work at a uh, lower risk time and they are and we are observing uh, that change in behavior right across the country Um, I mentioned about um, additional protection. So remote control T CODs or track circuit operating devices. There is an obvious fear uh, that signalers may inadvertently put trains into plan line blockages. It does happen. Um, the the way to um, stop that happening is additional protection. So we've got a, a large program um, of interventions uh, designed to uh, reduce the risk of trains being put into line blocks. So signal error. And so far this year, we've deployed 500. Uh, remote control track circuit operating devices and by the end of the financial year in April we anticipate a further 700 being in the ground which is uh, which is really great to see. Um, and again, hopefully that will move on. There we, go. Um, we are also modernising our work bank so uh, things like risk-based maintenance where we've got newer assets and we don't need to inspect them as frequently or we've got for instance, the monitoring fleet, and we can convert basic um, visual inspections to automated inspections. There's a number of things that we can do, including eddy current and, and, and um, a number of other you know, um, techniques that we can basically switch on and remove the need for a human being to go on the track. And we are busy with that right across the country. We've got about 11,000 miles of plane line pattern recognition now switched on. It's gone up about another 2,000 miles in the, last, um, in the last 12 to 18 months. And um, we've also, um, one of the um, perversities of COVID is a slightly lower uh, frequency of timetable, which has enabled us to run more test trains, which has then increased our ability, or will do after Christmas, to switch on more um, uh, automated monitoring. Um, and that's, um, that's, a, that's a, a line of, um, of uh, risk reduction that we're taking. There are obviously, there are obviously uh, other things we've got to be careful of, um, but this is, this is one of our, our techniques that we're using. So using you know, good new technology, to, to, to eliminate the need for track workers to work on open railways at high risk and busy times. Frontline engagement is important as well. So we've got um, somewhere in the order of 25,000 maintenance workers and we are very busy right across the country in every route in every region changing habits um, of, of how people plan and do work. So um, the, this can't be seen to be a national programme that does things to people it's got to be um, teams engaged so we we um, we have regular drop-in sessions uh, with routes uh, at, at depots with frontline maintenance workers we have regular um, leadership 
Um, and that, when I'm talking leadership, I'm talking route directors, IMDMs, heads of maintenance and others are chairing calls themselves who are, and they're driving on their um, risk reduction programmes and track worker safety programmes. And uh, what you see on this slide is a selection of, the, of, the, of either mess rooms or um, in socially distant car parks, uh, uh, venues um, and, and things where we are showing our teams uh, what they can do and the, and the things that we are uh, able to offer them to protect them uh, and prevent the, uh, the likes of Marvel happen again. And we get really good um, um, tangible feedback and dialogue at these types of sessions. It's really important. Um, hearts and minds, it's really important that we manage hearts and minds. There is an anecdote that says that um, all we're looking to do is transfer work and do it on night. Um, that's not based, um, based on facts or being um, really clear uh, to provide data that shows whilst we may be moving more tasks to night work, we're not moving as many people to night work. Um, the chart that you can see here um, on Western route, we've reduced unassisted lookout working from 20% down to below 5%, but in actual fact, we've only got 1.6% more people on nights than compared to um, the time when we started the exercise. So what we're able to demonstrate is that we're effectively batching and planning uh, with a higher degree of successful delivery. Uh, and, and, and that is a, a you know, you know, make no bones about it, that's an, a more efficient way to deliver maintenance. Um, but what we're able to also demonstrate is if you plot the fatigue index, um, that we are improving also the fatigue index whilst we're doing that. And that, um, um, that um, helps us to manage hearts and minds when it comes to um, perceptions that we're going to put everybody on nights. Bear with me. Sorry, it's flipped on two slides. There we go. Um, another thing that we're looking to do as well is we're um, um, unashamedly we're going to copy our supply chain. Which supply chain uses the rail hub system to do safe system of work package planning, or, or many of our suppliers do. Um, it's a proven system. We're not going back to the days of Procyon with PDSW. Um, we have got the uh, the Procyon, sorry, the um, the rail hub system. Uh, we can also um, put some additional um, overlays on that system to to um, make sure that we can geographically liven up packs at the right access point and also swipe people in and out of work packages using the sentinel system so um, that's another thing that we're, um, we're, we're aiming to achieve uh, from april next year which should also help us provide better assurance and uh, compliance um, in, so in summary uh, we are looking to um, take uh, the 28 million tasks that are batched in um, uh, in the 4.3 million work orders that we deliver, and we're basically looking to eliminate circa 1 million uh, tasks or work orders rather that are done with a lookout flag. And there's a number of ways that we're looking to do that. We're looking to um, more sensibly use line blockages, but also put additional protection, uh, more effectively use um, uh, possessions, but also um, modernise tasks so we don't need to put human beings on a track. So where are we now? We've got about 18 months left to go before the compliance date, and we're about 30% of the way through our plan. We've got about 5,500 milestones. We've delivered about 1,700 of those milestones. And I'm really pleased to say that we can see a tangible reduction in near miss frequency. I'll just move on a bit, there we go. So if you look at the graph in the middle at the bottom, you can see the number of head, so um, this time last year, we would see on average as a rolling average, um, somewhere between 60 and 70 near misses per annum and that was a, a, a trend that was static over three years. What I'm really pleased to say is that with, um, with a lot more consciousness in this area we've reduced the, the run rate of near misses and um, in period seven uh, the, the, the moving annual average was um, just below 40 which is really encouraging. Sorry I uh, uh, a call on my, on my uh, computer there to, as a distraction there. I beg your pardon. So yeah, um, you can see that we, we are reducing um, near misses and the frequency between near misses when you normalise it by hours worked is also improving. So the, 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 the average for near misses now uh, in terms of hours between near misses is heading north of 1.3 million hours between near misses. Um, and there are certain routes and regions that are significantly uh, safer than that level as well, which is really pleasing to see.
there's a dashboard here. I'm not going to go into, in, I'm running um, slightly short of time, but we've provided a, a route based dashboard of in, um, input KPIs, so leading measures and lagging measures, and we're able to work with routes. This is not this is not purposefully a league table. What it's enabling us to do is focus effort in certain areas. So as a, for instance, capital delivery on Northwest and Central and some of the routes that have seen higher levels of near miss, we've been able to really focus on the analysis that we've done um, and put in place corrective measures to help them um, reduce their risk. Um, but we track this and publish this in real time all of the time, uh, which, is, which is useful. And we've got a... Um, uh, you know, a, a regular set of um, metrics that we put to the Network Rail board in terms of confidence. Overall, I've got, a, I'm pessimistic, deliberately so, because I know this is such a difficult task to do, but we've got a medium degree of confidence at this time uh, of complying with the notices, because we've got a number of unknowns that we've got to work towards and close out. So, um, but what I can show you there also on the far right hand side is that every route and every region has declared a date where unassisted lookout working will stop, and I welcome that move. So in the first year, um, we've made quite a lot of progress. Like I said, um, the number of near misses has reduced um, a significant amount. Um, we have got £253 million pounds worth of authority that I'm working, uh, sorry, that I've secured, and we, we're creating more um, safe line side as, um, access points, safe walkways. We are modernising with technology. <clears throat> and there's a number of things that we're doing uh, where we are, uh, are purposefully tackling the risk factors that I uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation. And what's next? So um, there's a number of unknowns that once we've dealt with them <clears throat> will increase my confidence levels. And um, you can see here over the next six months, securing access, making sure we get additional protection um, to the levels where we need it, <clears throat> putting our, our, our um, safety critical walkways into a lips, further reviews of our work bank, further alignment of our roster, um, much more um, knowledge on signal workload risk and the engagement with our front line. And that's our key focus now as we go through the winter to make sure that the unknowns that we're dealing with in these um, in, in, in our program, that we, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll get to April or May of next year. And um, we would have bottomed out long, um, long since um, known issues. And we'll have a very tangible and clear sense of direction to compliance in 2022. And the next step for me after the Margam report of, um, of, of, that was issued by Rave a couple of weeks ago, um, I thoroughly respect um, what they said about um, non-technical skills and human factors. And I'm really pleased to say that the 28,000 crosses that currently exist in Sentinel, I got permission from our executive leadership team on the 13th of October to put in, plus, put in place a robust non-technical skills programme to improve um, the way that our our courses or, or, or soon to be picks, persons in charge, um, you know, to give them much, much more um, insight into what can go wrong um, when delivering or planning and delivering work on site and give them effective techniques to address that, um, uh, address those risks. And um, we start in the new year with um, enhancements to cost training, but um, as we go through April, um, that will build even further. So this, this will be leaving a legacy whereby um, we give, we give our frontline safety leaders the, um, the skills uh, to equip themselves to, um, to keep not only themselves safe, but the teams, uh, to the teams that they lead safe as well. So that's just, um, that's, that's, that's hot off the press and that's, our, that's, that's leaving the legacy that should, um, that should address this issue once and for all. That's me done. So that's uh, a couple of minutes late, but apologies for that. Um, if I can um, hand back to Joan, if that's okay. That's okay, Nick. That's okay. Um, you came in just a few minutes over, but it's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Um, I certainly know from my own experience, it's not easy to drive any kind of, of change. Um, you certainly got a, a massive task there in front of you and seem to be making good progress. Um, so we've got progress, one. Then, it's, it's, uh, it's, slow. It's, it's slow, isn't it? It's hard. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a question here from actually from one of our ex-colleagues, Nick, wherever he is in the world. Kamal Sharma, welcome Kamal. And um, Kamal's question is, has safer methods of working increased productivity as well? Have you seen that? Um, it's hard to say definitively because COVID um, 
has changed the game as well. So um, we have got, um, if you look at the time on tools measure, you can't really see any um, tangible changes uh, in, in, the, in the time on tools measure. If we get this right, sorry, I'll be more confident when we get this right, um, what we should be observing is uh, less tasks overall, uh, more tasks batched efficiently and effectively. And then when we go to do those tasks, those tasks will then, you've got a high degree of certainty of doing those tasks. And that should then give uh, rise to more reliable infrastructure, which is obviously what we all want. And also what it should do is see reductions in things such as overtime and, um, and labour any subcontractors and other cashable benefits. So the answer is it should do, it should make us more efficient, but at the moment I haven't, because there are a number of other factors in, in play at the same time, um, I can't demonstrate those benefits yet. Okay, thank you, thank you. And um, I've, I've got a question actually for, for you from myself. Um, so what more do you think that PWI members can do to reduce the risk of track workers being struck by a train? So yesterday's event in Eastleigh shows or demonstrates that, these, that there, are, there is risk everywhere all the time. And what I would ask from the PWI is um, for, for there are things that we can do to develop uh, technology or techniques to eliminate risk. So Joan, as a for instance, once upon a time, we used to have a near miss every third week with high output track renewals with surveying. And we developed RILA and we took people out of daytime surveying and then we didn't, we then start to see a reduction in near misses with surveying because we developed alternative ways. So I guess a few things I would ask, what tasks do we do now in risky type um, interventions? Could, could we modernize with technology or other techniques so that we do them in less riskier ways? Question mark. Um, and also, um, you can be conscious in safety or you can be unconscious. I've, I observe a lot of people that are unconscious when it comes to driving safe outcomes. And, and I, I would ask every single member of the PWI to be conscious. Think about those risks. Think about, is it safer to work on an open railway or a shut railway? Um, it, and there are other things, you know, in, in your everyday life, um, when you think about what you do with your family or, you know, uh, driving motor vehicles and all sorts of things. So what I'd ask is everyone to be conscious in, in the way that they plan work and, and plan proactively to eliminate risk, because you can do it. Okay, thank you, Nick, thanks. Right, we're, I'm gonna take one more question, which I've got one here from Andy Franklin. And um, it's okay. quite quite long. So it is is good to see a focus on collection on collecting good data to make informed decisions. My question is around the use of monitoring trains, such as the UTU. These tell us what is happening, but we still need a short-term follow-up to verify the results. With track recording, the information tells you what is happening, but not why it is happening. How do we provide windows of access to support this often short-term work? So I need to just check my understanding of the question, I think. so. Um, I know myself in maintenance and Western implementing further UTU functionality. So, for instance, any current testing, there were issues with repeat suspects. So if you get a suspect defect, then you've got to put people to work to go and check. Is that a real defect or is it not a real defect? And talking to the people in Derby, um, I believe I'm right in saying that positional accuracy um, in terms of software on the trains is being upgraded as we speak this month, which should help them reduce suspects. And um, hopefully that will go some of the way to then uh, reducing the amount of times that we uh, either erroneously or purposefully put people on the track to follow monitoring trains. The other thing I'd say as well is we're getting, I guess, um, we're getting cleverer at predicting run rates of defects beyond certain runs. and um, I would say it's what a wise thing to do, um, if, if it's possible, and I understand it's not always possible, is to plan your UTU runs with access that follows it. So as a for instance, 
when we first, uh, I'm talking quite a long time ago now, Joe, when we, when we first implemented high output trap renewals midweek, we basically disrupted the UTU plan, but then disrupted its following defect removal plan that followed that. So I think, um, you know, wherever we possibly can, obviously making the trains, the test trains run as reliably as possible, but then what they collect being as accurate and repeatable as possible is important. And then if there's an inevitability that you're going to find defects, I would say, and then making sure that you've got access that follows those collect, you know, data collection runs to deal with them. Yeah. I hope okay. that, if, Andy, if you can drop me a question separately by email, then if I've got the context wrong, I'm sorry. Okay, th thank you very much for that, Nick. We still do have a few questions, um, but we're, we've run out of time, unfortunately. So, so, Nick, what we can do is get the questions to you directly, and then perhaps you can feed back to the individuals after the event. That would be very helpful. So, thank you very no much, Nick, once yeah, again. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, happy, thank you. Happy Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our next speaker um, is Stephen Barber, who's, who's the PWI CEO, I'm sure as many of you know. So Stephen is a fellow of the PWI and a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers and of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. He is committed to the development of the PWI and particularly to its role in harnessing railway systems engineering knowledge from industry and the academic world and spreading that understanding widely through the institution's membership. So welcome, Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I am going to um, talk to you this afternoon uh, a bit about my experience. Um, that's it. Uh, a, a rather broader perspective uh, of system safety on the railways. Um, and particularly looking at, at some historical incidents uh, and thinking about what we mustn't forget. Um, the, the corporate memory is notoriously short uh, and, and the railway industry is no different from any other in that respect. Um, so I'm just going to have a look through uh, a series of, of incidents that have, that have occurred in my working career. I joined British Railways in 1974 and was in the industry until I left uh, Transport for London in 2018 or in the front line. Um, I'm now still in the industry, uh, but uh, with a more backseat role at the PWI CEO. Uh, so I was going to look at uh, a, a series of incidents that have had a, a seminal effect on our industry. Clapham 1988 through to Wimbledon, a, a small incident in Wimbledon, um, and try and pass on or make sure that, that you, you know where to go to get some of the learning from those incidents uh, and the consequent improvements we have made. It is critical um, that we maintain corporate memory. Um, the 2017 derailment at Waterloo uh, repeated some of the, the errors uh, that were made uh, that lay behind the Clapham disaster in 1988. And it's important that we don't allow those lessons uh, to fade, that we remain vigilant. So just looking at Clapham, um, briefly what happened, uh, a very poorly executed interlocking wiring change caused a wrong side failure, uh, allowing one train to be driven in the back of the other. Uh, and then very shortly after that initial collision, a third train plowed into the wreckage. Uh, combined result was 35 fatalities, uh, a very, very serious uh, and, and very deadly accident. Uh, what went wrong is a sort of catalogue of management errors. Uh, a, a great um, great criti critique of British Railways at the time in many ways, uh, that these things were tolerated. Uh, dangerous working practices, poor supervision, lack of competence management, no briefing system, uh, no effective resource management, uh, no ma management of fatigue, poor project controls, uh, design office processes uh, not managed, no effective learning, no analysis or learning from unprotected wrong side failures. Uh, the organization at the time was under-resourced uh, and no no impact assessment had been carried out on what that level of under-resourcing meant for the project. So people were still trying to deliver. 
and there was ineffective communication up and down the management chain. Uh, the, the hidden uh, inquiry report, it's 230 odd pages, is still well worth a read in terms of how not to do it, how an organization shouldn't be managed. To BR's credit, it picked up the challenge and, and laid many of the foundations for what we now recognize as good railway systems management. But it was uh, an appalling event uh, and, and created uh, waves uh, throughout the industry in this country. A well with, uh, with report well worth reading. Moving on um, to 2000, uh, post privatization, uh, the railway industry had been through several reorganizations, uh, the last of which had delivered rail track and a series of supply companies. Uh, one of which was looking after the railway uh, between King's Cross and, Edi and uh, the Scottish border um, and uh, conspired uh, with Railtrack unconsciously, I'm sure, to um, allow a 35 metre length of rail to disintegrate under a train travelling at high speed with four resulting fatalities. Uh, again, um, really Janet and John errors uh, as we would see them now, but I think at the time not really recognized as such by the organization at large. There was non-compliance with standards, non-compliance that was recognized but not acted upon. It was a poor appreciation of risk with no formal risk assessments. Um, really uh, a, a hanging offense uh, in this day and age a cultural unwillingness to uh, apply control measures, uh, in, incomplete and ineffective audit, uh, incorrect information in work management systems, and a major work backlog. An under-resourced organization, again, note that resourcing point, frequent staff changes, and a lack of experience within the management team. Moving on again to 2002, Potter's Bar this time, uh, not a million miles from Hatfield, but not really related, a different contractor, still in the rail track era, where uh, the maladjustment of a stretcher bar and back drive led to a fatigue failure in the, of the, the lock stretcher, allowing a switch blade to move under a train traveling at high speed. The resulting derailment was uh, extremely spectacular with the, you can see the, uh, the vehicle lodged under the platform canopy at Potter's Bar. What went wrong? Well, an, an, in, an inadequate understanding of the system design of the points themselves, no risk assessment to inform the maintenance regime, no procedure or training for the installation and maintenance of the particular equipment concerned, Weaknesses in defect recognition, reporting and work recording systems were not up to the, up to the task, and an absence of um, elimination of failures by design. So again, um, considerable weaknesses in the management system. On to Grey Rig, uh, now in the network rail era. Um, where some of the organizational pressures had maybe been reduced a bit, there was no longer uh, inter nissan warfare between uh, the infrastructure manager and its contractors. Everything had been, uh, all the maintenance tasks had been taken in house. But again, another stretcher bar and back drive maladjustment, failure of the locking stretcher and fastenings. Um, and the LA again allowed a very similar situation to arrive at uh, arises at. Potter's Bar in that the switchblade moved under a train traveling at high speed. Some of the underlying factors here um, were about the, the ability to carry out inspections under a very access hungry railway. Uh, there were very limited opportunities at the north end of the West Coast Main Line at the time to carry out inspections, which led to the an inspection in this case not being carried out, an inspection that would have revealed the fault uh, and would have presented the accident. Um, previous system performance was taken as a guarantor of a, a low risk asset, which was uh, a misreading of the situation. And the 
importance of residual switch opening and flange back contact on system loading was not recognized. The, the, there was no HAZOP um, or, or FEMA that uh, recognized the importance of setting up these systems correctly. Again, competence management and the level of audit were also uh, criticized. Moving on again um, to Transport for London this time off the mainline network. Um, I suppose in some ways a classic wide gauge derailment, but why did an engineer's train uh, fall into the forefoot at Earl's Court? Uh, there were no injuries, a lot of embarrassment because the Piccadilly line stayed closed for a long time. But again, what went wrong? Um, so faults in the, in the track system were either not identified, not reported or misclassified. There was actually insufficient time for inspections. Recorded track geometry gauge exceedances were not communicated. Track, track system was track recording system was running but nobody actually passed that information to the maintenance teams on the ground. There was ineffective surveillance and audit. Uh, this time London Underground was auditing the PFI contractor, but that, it, that auditing, that surveillance appeared to be deeply ineffective. So the concerns, people had concerns about the site, but they were not acted on or escalated. The organization, once again, under-resourced, extended vacancies in key roles. And one of the point that's unusual for this, the, the, un, an unusual point associated with this uh, incident was that the, the standards were criticized for being actually very difficult, if not impossible, for staff at the front end of the, of the coalface to actually apply because there were provisions about uh, the presence of multiple defects that were almost impossible for patrol staff or uh, supervisors to analyze and apply. So that was a, a, a question of people writing standards that in, in the real world couldn't be applied. Wimbledon, um, some of the unknown unknowns that uh, Donald Rumsfeld was so fond of. Um, the direct cause of this accident is another wide to gauge accident, um, quite still quite un still unfortunately uncommon in the rail uh, in, in the rail industry. Um, this was a, an instance where actually a type of fastening failed. Uh, there were known weaknesses in the in that type of fastening, uh, but there was no uh, no control regime in, in this particular section of track. And the reason there was no control regime was because the area between uh, Network Rail and Transport for London at this location uh, was, the, the boundaries for that area had been set or been moved by Network Rail and uh, Transport for London, such that there was a 120 meter gap between the two boundaries, 120 meters of track that had been uninspected and unmaintained for at least eight years. Uh, and through multiple organization changes. Uh, successive revisions of the inspection routes did not cross-reference base asset information held in other departments. And again, the surveillance and audit regimes did not identify the discrepancy. Uh, I know from personal experience that uh, in Transport for London, boundaries as an issue were actually considered to be quite low risk. So were not the focus of, uh, of audit effort. Thinking a little beyond or looking a little beyond the rail industry and moving on to 2017, um, what lessons can we learn from other sectors? Uh, we all have heard of Grenfell Tower, the fire. Uh, there have been multiple uh, reports written on this. Uh, it killed 71 people. Uh, what went wrong? Well, the materials used to clad the tower simply did not meet the custom combustibility requirements of the regulations guidance. Residents' concerns about internal uh, defects in the building were systematically ignored. The overall management system 
the system of uh, regulation and guidance was overly complex and unclear to an awful lot of the people involved. Procurement of the cladding exercise was driven by quick and cheap. And the system's weaknesses, the overall management system's weaknesses, were difficult to locate and understand. There was no overall systems map as to how fire fire worthiness in such buildings as this was actually managed. Uh, roles and responsibilities of those involved were unclear. There was a, a gain little or no competent, formal competence management regime. Um, and guidance, the, what guidance there was, was often misunderstood and misrepresented. Uh, and the, the, the final inquiry uh, into, into this, the, the legal inquiry into this incident is still ongoing. Uh, but it is likely to lead to major changes in the way that high rise buildings are, are looked after. Uh, Thankfully, I think some of those lessons were learned by the rail industry a long time ago. It's just a pity we didn't manage to transfer some of them to uh, the building and construction sector. Finally, in my, uh, in my group of incidents, I thought we might just say a few words about the Boeing 737 MAX um, saga. Um, this new aeroplane, designed by a highly reputable company, um, previously an exemplar of, of ethical safety behaviours, um, crashed. Two crashes in October 2018 and March 2019 led to the grounding of the entire fleet, not to mention 346 fatalities. Um, so again, here, what went wrong? Um, so a hidden automated flight control system in certain circumstances repeatedly created unsafe conditions. The problem was that as far as the crew concerned, was concerned, this system didn't really exist because it was buried in the, uh, in the aircraft's control systems. After the first crash, Boeing rapidly introduced a, a, a manual recovery procedure or wrote a manual recovery procedure, but it was not proven and proved in the second crash to be completely ineffective. But the consequences of system failure were not properly assessed and incor incorrect assumptions about crew responses were made. The new system was deliberately misrepresented to avoid scrutiny. Boeing actually went out of their way to avoid going through the, uh, the, the, the correct scrutiny processes for the new design. The manufacturer exerted undue pressure on aircraft inspectors dismissed employee concerns, prioritized deadline and budget constraints over safety, lacked transparency in disclosing essential information. So engineering flaws, mismanagement, cover up, and also poor oversight were all cited in the reasons for this failure. Taking a sort of an overview, um, what are we getting better at in terms of managing safety. I think one of the one of the uh, misconceptions is that we we don't understand asset risk. Uh, going into the background of all those incidents, the risks around the asset themselves are actually really well understood uh, within the industries concerned. I think the only one where there's any doubt really whether the, the, the risks were understood at the time of the incident was Potter's Bar. After Potter's Bar, the general risks associated with stretcher bars were understood, but those risks, uh, the, that understanding was not applied to the stretcher bar system in use at Grey Rig. Engineering safety management, the systematic application of engineering safety management. Uh, this really started as a result within our industry, it started as a, as a result of the Hatfield disaster, sorry, the Clapham disaster. Um, but it was applied spasmodically. It was not applied consistently uh, and often um, was the victim of budgetary and resource pressures. Things have got better. Uh, and I think Nick's recent presentation uh, is a real exemplar of how fact and data are increasingly brought to bear on issues of safety. 
I think one of our biggest uh, Achilles heels within the rail industry, though, has been the understanding of the risk around work management, uh, the confusion between recording of defects and the recording of the work required to eradicate those defects, and the, the lack of a process for ensuring robustness of those work management systems, uh, a robustness of the data that they contain. And there have also been problems with culture and ethics. Um, certainly the, the culture uh, in British Railways and uh, around the time of Clapham was not, it has to be clearly said, safety focused. There were serious cultural issues around rail track and some of the contractors around the Hatfield uh, disaster. Um, culture at Gloucester Road was not good. Um, I think the situation was different by the time we got to 2017 in Wimbledon. And looking at uh, the two outside uh, uh, incidents, Grenfell Tower and 737, there were major cultural and ethical failings on the part of many of those involved. So just on to a concluding slide, I hope. Um, so, as I said, asset risk is well understood. New railways can employ engineering safety management systems from the outset and can apply those to all the assets they intend to use. But is in the wider rail industry, legacy assets and systems pervade existing networks. Uh, there's a real question about even now, whether we understand their failure modes and criticality. Defect identification of work management processes and systems are absolutely critical to infrastructure, safe infrastructure management. And the reliance on human beings to make those systems work and the amount of the, the scope for error in, uh, in, in, in humans' involvement in those systems is an area that I don't think is yet properly understood or properly risk, risk assessed and the risks properly controlled. Do we actually do HAZOPs or FAMICAs on our management systems, on our management systems of safety critical defects? Are we aware of those where those systems are weak? And I don't think uh, we yet have a clear answer to those questions. I think it's, it's an area that I would like to see some progress in. Do we understand uh, the performance of those management systems in QRA terms and indeed what we might do to improve it? Will data quality in our systems ever reach the level, the standard required for autonomous operations? I think that's an open question at the moment. And, and how do we go about correcting wrong culture, wrong ethics? Um, I think some of the, some of the, the practical advice I would offer um, is to always act on concerns, never brush a concern under the carpet. If in any doubt, apply risk controls and escalate. Don't put all your trust in audit re regimes. Go and take a look. Uh, and remember, defect recording and work management systems are actually central to maintaining a safe railway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Very interesting presentation. Always interesting, isn't it, to, to look back previous incidents to say what you can learn to take to take forward. Um, so and if we have any questions, please can you put them in the in the question section now. I can't see anything coming in just yet. So I do have a um, question that came in earlier on, Stephen. In the light of the railways likely position after COVID-19, what do you think are the major safety challenges and risks facing the industry just now at present time? I think the probably the single largest potential risk is that of the government actually taking uh, a large chunk of money out of the industry. Um, the, the industry's had a very good 10 years or more uh, of consistent funding, um, of adequate resource levels, of progress in, in improving management systems. There are still problems in, in some areas, but it's not uh, that there has been consistent progress. And I think another round of screw tightening, similar to those experienced in the 1990s and early 2000s, 
would start to apply pressures to those out on the front line, pressures which they may not be feel feel equipped to, to deal with. And so I, I would I'm wor I get concerned about some of the progress that we've made in in robustness of attitudes in good culture actually falling away under a reimposition of severe financial pressures to the industry. Yes, not understandable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. We don't have any other questions at this present time, Stephen. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and I will now introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Stephen. So our next speaker today is Rob Sherin. He's the Managing Director and Principal Consultant for Leaps Limited. Starting as a Senior Authorised Engineer, Rob went on to leadership positions in construction, operations and electrical control functions with two of the regional electricity companies prior to a move into railway electrification. Since changing industries, Rob has held key engineering and program management positions with West Coast Route Modernisation, Southern Power Supply Upgrade, Crop Rail, and the Great Western Electrification Programme. In recent years, he has been instrumental in national initiatives to improve electrical safety and prevent a significant incidents involving high voltage electrical incidents. Welcome, Rob. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. I can hear you. Brilliant. Good stuff. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to a sunny Hampshire. Hoping to get out of lockdown soon. Um, it's uh, it's well needed. Um, going to talk to you about uh, overhead line electrical safety. Um, I'm going to focus on the uh, the accidents over the last 20 years. Um, and then um, I'm going to take a closer look at the hazard um, and it's sort of going to dovetail quite nicely with the work Nick's been doing um, and the messages coming out of his presentation. Um, so going to explore the hazard um, and then look at how we manage it going forward, um, look at the changes that are going to be coming in with regard to electrical safety. Um, yeah, and finish with some key messages. So. Um, here is the um, diagram that I spend most time talking to. Um, every single um, block on this chart is um, a life-changing injury. That's the ones in blue and the ones in red are the three fatalities that we've had. Um, all of these are contact with 25 kV overhead line. Um, and I guess since I last spoke at a PWI event last year, um, it was looking good, uh, 2014 was a bad year, um, but we'd gone um, approaching, uh, well, it was nearly five years actually, and then Christmas 2019, Christmas day itself, um, unfortunately, um, Alistair came into contact with uh, 25,000 volts, uh, Old Oak Common Depot, um, a linesman, and we had many of the same causes uh, that we've had before. Um, so we're not there yet. Um, and uh, just gonna have a look at the, so the key themes that come out of it, they haven't changed. Um, residual electrical hazards catch us out. So these are the things that remain live uh, on the 25 kV system whilst we are working within an isolation. Um, we always know what's live somewhere along the planning process but unfortunately, those there on the night sometimes stray outside of those isolations. Um, and that's when we have the serious incidents. Um, it's practically always associated with late change. And the other key thing is um, it's those that are working closest to the conductors. And in uh, you know my part of the rail industry, it's the linesmen. Uh, they're only at best 7% of the railway workforce but 70% of the accidents happen to linesmen. And when they do come into contact, it's always serious. Um, after that, um, the next most likely group, it is the PY staff, it is those working in depots. It's those working with uh, yellow plants, engineering trains, um, and 
uh, yeah, it's when we, we're on top of those vehicles and we're in the wrong place. So it's not necessarily the person being in the wrong place, it's the whole train and the individual on top of the train. Um, so what does that look like for the, um, the track and the P-way related ones? Well, there they are. I was actually on the, uh, the formal panel for Stafford in 2013, uh, a very unfortunate uh, worker who was on top of a, a rail grinding train. Um, never quite got to the bottom of why he would be on top of that train. Um, but that's a sort of incident that um, very, very rare on average. Uh, there was a big run of them in the early part of this century. Generally, it's every 10 years going back all the way to the start of electrification systems. We have people inadvertently being on top of uh, rolling stock um, when the overhead line's live. Um, and often, although those ones were lucky, uh, it can be uh, more likely to be a fatality. Um, causes are very similar, always late change. Um, and again, um, interesting point with, with Stephen's presentation. Um, we understand the asset, but um, we have had to get a lot better at the understanding of the electrical hazard. Um, and when it's P-Way and uh, those staff outside of electrification and plant, then it's that knowledge and understanding of the asset which is problematic. Um, and, you know, a, a dead conductor looks the same as a live conductor. Um, it sounds the same. It looks the same. It doesn't sound any different. Um, you know, we are dealing with a, a very unusual hazard. So I wanted to sort of talk about that hazard really um, and um, probably contrast the differences between uh, what Nick's challenge is and, and network rail at the moment with uh, people in the forefoot on the operational railway and the challenges we have with people inside um, isolations. So pretty much everything uh, that I've learned as I've become uh, more and more of a safety specialist goes back to um, Heinrich's triangle. It's called the accident triangle. Um, and it it's really a, an accident severity distribution. Um, and it builds on unsafe acts and says that there'll be a proportional number of near misses and then a, a likewise a similar proportional number of minor accidents. And then you'll start to get unlucky with serious accidents and then you'll be very unlucky and you'll have a fatality. Um, now that was the early part of the last century um, and that's the precise figures uh, from Heinrich's original triangle. Various people have come along um, and they've reviewed those figures for different industries um, and they've come up with slightly different proportions. Um, but I think the subtlety of this is what they're actually reviewing is not so much the industry, but the hazard. Um, now, now the hazard Nick's talking about clearly is, is, is moving trains, you know, 1,000 tonnes of steel going at 125 miles an hour. It's that sort of thing. The hazard that I lay awake at night with is 25,000 volts. Uh, and that hazard is very different, although it's got the ability to propel 1,000 tonnes of steel at 125 miles an hour. So there's energy there and some. So we're just gonna work through an example and I'm gonna do it from a bottom up. And um, I'm, a, I'm a Portsmouth football fan um, and I'm missing my football. I'm missing Fratton Park. Um, so I've got a picture of a football stadium here. Unfortunately, not Fratton Park, but uh, it's a football stadium and it's a set of steps. And I'm gonna look at the hazard, gravity is a hazard. So we're looking at falling down, falling down those steps. And if we look at, and, and I've taken and made these figures up, but I'm sort of saying that for every, let's say a million times someone goes up and down those steps, uh, there'll be 10,000 unsafe acts. So 10,000 times someone will spot a loose tread, um, a, a handrail defect, and they'll report it and get it repaired. And, and that's the end of it. But for every 10,000 of those, there'll be a thousand near misses where they don't just spot it, but someone actually trips on those stairs. So I might trip and, and the handrail's there. I catch myself on a handrail. Perhaps I'm rushing, um, you know, but probably think nothing more of it. I'm likely to even report it. 
but technically we've had a near miss there. And let's say for every thousand of those near misses, we'll have a hundred minor injuries. So hundred times, um, I, I don't catch myself, uh, I jar my ankle, I've got a sprained ankle, um, I'm probably still fit for work, I'm not gonna have time off. Yes, I'll fill in the accident book, um, but I probably won't need any medical intervention. But for every hundred of those, um, I might fall all the way from top to bottom of those stairs and unfortunately um, I'm, I'm going to break a leg um, and then I will be off work you know we're in the riddle reportable type uh, serious incident um, and yeah not a good place and for every 10 of those um, I'm going to be really really unlucky and I end up at the bottom of the stairs and it's my head that takes the impact and that's it, it's lights out for me, um, it's a fatality. Um, and we can see that triangle and you, you might have a different view on those, um, on those figures, um, you, you might have your own figures, you might have a view that something's too light or too heavy. It doesn't matter, what we've got is a big volume of unsafe acts and near misses at the bottom of it. And if we respond, review and prevent those, what actually happens is the proportions don't change. All we are doing, if we manage the bottom ones effectively and react to them correctly, then we drive that fatality and those major injuries further into the future. Now, safety's got a lot better. There's behavioral safety. There's all sorts of um, new techniques um, and risk assessment has come on a million miles as uh, Stephen was alluding to but we still have to have the incidents and the data to manage things. And I, and I think really key what Nick was saying there, that you, you, you by getting that data and managing it correctly and making sure it is, is sound data, you can then build the decisions over a period of time, which prevent the top half of the triangle. So let, let's, let's work this one again, but we're gonna do it for coming into contact with the overhead line. So this is a person coming into contact with a 25 kV live conductor. And this time I'm gonna start at the top of the triangle and work my way down. So there we go. Uh, if you remember it from the graph at the start, we've got three fatalities. Um, so that's already sort of in the, along the lines of the previous graphs uh, triangles. So that's reasonable. Um, so how many major injuries? Well, they were on the graph as well. Uh, I've got to add one to this. It's actually 23 because this, this triangle, I haven't added the unfortunate incident at Christmas. But we've got that relationship, haven't we? That three to 22, that's a reasonable uh, uh, relationship. So uh, we, next we go to uh, minor injury. So um, let me ask the question, how often do, does somebody come into contact with 25,000 volts and walk away and fill out the accident book and come to work the next day? Well, I've done a lot of research, uh, not into this particular question, but the general area of electrical safety. I've studied most of the accidents all the way back to the 60s, and I am not aware of a single minor injury from someone coming into contact with 25,000 volts. Lots of people have come into contact with unearthed conductors and got some form of a belt, but unfortunately, it is not an accident book scenario if you come into contact with 25,000 volts. Okay, so how many near misses um, and uh, close calls? Well, again, I, I, I really struggle here. Um, and I, I think we've got to say that, well, there, there must be some, um, and there must be people out there that could answer that question and say, you know, have you been involved and come too close to 25,000 volts? And I, I guess my challenge back is if you can't see it, you can't hear it, um, you can't smell it, um, none of your senses can detect it. How do you know you were too close? How do you know it was a near miss? Weren't you just lucky? So again, we haven't got that many hundreds of um, incidents to review and to 
give us that information to drive an improvement program and a change program. So let's go to the unsafe acts. Well, well clearly we do have unsafe acts. Um, we, we call them isolation irregularities um, and, and we do have a number of those. Um, and they're, they're, they're important. I think, you know, my, my view on that is that we, we don't often treat them as precursors to the fatalities and major injuries we're more likely um, to treat them as a very minor issue and, and often more of a performance issue um, as to where did it go wrong, why did we lose the work type thing. Um, so we have this very, very unusual um, accident severity distribution uh, model, um, which means that we, we've got a place where um, staff in the depots, uh, staff that work for yourselves, contractors, um, everybody. No one is coming into the depots talking about the near misses. No one is talking about the minor accidents and the near misses because we don't have many at all. And the problem is everyone, it drives a behavior where everyone thinks they're fine until we're immediately into life-changing burns or fatalities. So a really, really unusual hazard and understanding that means that we have to take different management interventions to the ones where we just rely on the normal of if we look after the minors and the close calls, then we'll drive the majors and the fatalities further into the distance. So key initiatives for dealing with this, if we, if we can't use all of the normal processes, what can we do? Well, we've got to develop a testing culture. Uh, we can't hear it, we can't see it, we can't smell it, but we can test it. And that is still work in progress. The electrical lifesaving rules came in um, in 2012, that summer, and um, we are still improving and trying to find our way with test before touch but it is that developing a, a testing culture which is a completely independent and additional control measure you know that in itself if we could get that right would drive those top half of that triangle would drive it into the tens of years and hundreds of years before we have those unfortunate events um, what else can we do uh, well, again, that, that focus that Stephen uh, was talking about, um, risk assessment since uh, the late 80s, early 90s has come on um, hugely and um, upskilling our EMP professionals in electrical risk assessment is what it's all about and will make a real difference on the night. Um, we've got to modify our safety standards uh, to support the modern electrification configuration. Lots of work gone on by designers to design out residual electrical hazards, but we haven't kept up with the standards and the safety rules. So there's a lot of effort going into that at the moment. And, and more than anything, it, it's the opportunity, and, and, and I'd like to thank you all very much for this opportunity to talk about it at events like this, to keep it fresh in people's minds, to you know, to keep talking about the hazard um, and the fact that it happens so rarely, yet it is always so serious um, that we that we need to keep keep it fresh. Um, yes, there's a lot of work going on uh, with Network Rail at the centre, the standards, big effort going into what's called the single approach to isolations. Really urge you to engage with that when you get the chance, because it is about uh, building in the lessons of those accidents. It's about um, a common standard and common techniques across all of our power systems. Um, it's all about risk assessment um, and, 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 and control measures and the reduction of the likelihood of people straying into those residual electrical hazards. Um, again, I sum up with the key messages there. Um, it's about those electrical life-saving rules. If we can get that right, we will drive the top half of that triangle into the future. If we don't get it right, we have not got the minor incidents and the near misses 
that will allow us to manage and change processes and improve skills. We will go along blissfully ignorant, thinking we're all fine until we're not fine and we have the Christmas Day incident down at Old Oak Common. It's the nature of the hazard and that accident severity distribution, which means that we have to do something. The biggest thing we can do is the life-saving rules for contact um, for testing um, before we earth and before we engage and touch conductors. Um, late changes, well, uh, I think, you know, Nick and, and that huge national effort that he's leading is going to be looking at that and addressing that. We've got to play our part in that. Um, and yeah, engage with that single approach to isolation, which focuses on electrical risk assessment and making sure that we match the control measures to the risk. Um, yeah, and we just got to remember, you know, there will not be the near misses and the minor accidents with 25 kV overhead line. We are, we are very close. It's always an impending disaster. We don't get the lead in. Um, so yeah, that uh, concludes my presentation. I'd like you thank you all for the chance to uh, talk about some of these important issues. Over to you, Jack. Thank you, Rob, very much indeed. That was. Um a very sobering and quite scary presentation from, from my perspective um, because you are right, electricity, you can't, you can't see it and that's probably one of the scariest things about it. So we do have some questions now. Um, right, let me see which one I'm going to pick. Right, here's, here's a, quite an interesting question. This is from John Parker. John, I'm going to read this one out. I agree, working on top of wagons, perhaps checking material is a particular hazard, especially when a siding is only part wired and you move along the train. I have also experienced a minor shock from induced current off the grid when working on isolated OLE, admittedly a long time ago. So I guess that's more a comment and observation really than a, than a question. So obviously John can really relate to the subject that you're talking about. Don't know if you yeah, want to no, add any comments, sir, Rob. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And 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 I guess in in this, I wouldn't like to belittle, um, you know, the contact with uh, conductors where there is um, where there is charge on them if they've not been properly earthed. Um, you, you know, particularly when you're at height, um, we have had incidents where um, you can get a a belt off of a thing and it can knock you off the wagon, and then you are into potentially serious injury. Um, so. Yes, it's um, it, it is it is still a problem, um, but it's not there in the scale um, and the consequence of uh, live conductors. But yeah, no, good good comment, John. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, question now from Tiente. Do you have any stats of fatal accidents with regard to third rail traction system? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they are working through it at the moment. Um, I did some work back in 2012 when I was with Network Rail, um, and it's very, very similar um, story. That the hazard is the same, so your your natural um, senses, you know, don't arm you to deal with it. Um, and it's it's worse in the sense that it is actually on on the ground in the forefoot, um, but the the volume uh, and the percentages are very similar, and we have that it's the same accident triangle in that we don't have a lot of near misses because we don't know that we've had a near miss, and we don't have we don't have minor incidents with 750 volts DC. You know, if you come between that and the running rail or the, um, the negative return, then um, it's going to be a very serious injury. Thank you. I'm now going to ask actually Kate if she can read a question that's come through in the chat because I can't see it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's a question Thank from you. Stephen, Stephen Barber to Rob. Are there lessons to be learned from the experience of others working with this type of risk? For example, the electrical distribution industry. Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, and uh, absolutely, it's it's the same hazard. And um, yes, it was it was a similar in in the electricity supply industry. Uh, unfortunately for the railway, it, it's ten times less likely to happen by volume of isolations. Hence, why the regulator is so focused on the railway because we are 
relatively poor compared with the distribution uh, and electricity companies. Um, but yes, their, their, their biggest challenge was, um, again, when, they, when they're working dead, straying outside into live, um, it's the same because we're just not equipped with the senses um, to deal with that hazard. They're 10 times better than we are, but they do have a testing culture. And I, when I was in the DNO, it is completely alien that anyone would go to work um, without doing a test at the point of work. Whereas, you know, Joan, we might never have met and there we will be at two o'clock in the morning. I'll issue you a bit of paper. And the next thing you'll do is climb on top of a wagon under the wires and start shoveling ballast off. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's when I came into the industry, I, I thought it was mad. Yeah, well, you're probably right. So we've got one, one final question in from Andy Franklin. Um, is it possible to develop a detector that will warn you if you are close to a live conductor, please? Yes, we, we did look at that um, extensively uh, back in 2010-11 um, and um, very successful in the nuclear industry, obviously, sort of radiation um, detection proximity alarms. Um, and, you know, I, th I think some of the technology Nick's looking at, um, you know, is that sort of thing, isn't it, um, where we can use the person's location. Um, unfortunately, with um, the uh, complexity of the overhead line, we couldn't get something that was as reliable. And we're not aware of anyone, uh, electricity companies or other railways elsewhere, we did look that are using anything. Um, there are manufacturers who want to develop something, but the margin of error is um, you know, quite incredible when you've got lots of wires and uh, you know, the knitting above some of the complex junctions. Um, you know, testing what you're about to work on is you know, the proven way of doing it that's you know, worldwide is done. So no, um, not looked at that. No one's doing that at the moment. Okay, perhaps it's something Thanks. for the future. General. Right, well, we, we, have, we don't have any more questions, Rob. So thank you very much for a um, very, very interesting presentation on a very scary subject. Um, certainly get people's attention. And, and I think that, that's part of it, isn't it? It's keeping people talking about it to make yeah, people, who are, people are aware of it. Um, so we shall now, thank you, Rob, very much indeed. Thank you. We shall now move on to the next presenter. And I'm going to welcome um, our first sponsor from Volcaria and introduce Stuart Webster Spriggs, who is the HSQES director for Volcaria. So, um, which is quite a long mouthful. So in, in, in long speak, Stuart is the health, safety, quality, environmental and sustainability director for Volcaria. He has worked on the UK rail infrastructure for 19 years. Um, with the la last nine years in his current role. And obviously we're all aware that Volker are one of the UK's leading multidisciplinary railway infrastructure contractors with many, many years experience in both heavy and light rail sectors. Stuart is responsible for continually improving Volker Rail's occupational health and safety, quality and environmental capabilities. Um, Stuart is a chartered member of the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and holds a B.Eng. in Mechanical Engineering. And just to let everyone know that this is the first presentation where we don't have any allocated time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat or in the question box and Stuart will um, come back to you on a one to one basis and, and answer your questions. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan, um, and thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Um, Bulk Rail is very pleased to be able to sponsor um, this event this afternoon, um, and thank you for the opportunity to engage with the PWI today. So, hopefully, everyone can hear me, and this is going to work. Okay, so what I want to talk about very briefly this afternoon um, is um, a contractor's uh, perspective for workforce safety. Um, and our safety two approach. What I'll do um, is I'll um, just give you a very brief overview of what I mean by safety two. Um, it's something that's um, not very new, 
um, but it's just something that's creeping into the rail industry now. So in a nutshell, um, this is what safety two means. Um, certainly, um, I think this displays it very well. Um, so it's the concept of work as imagined versus work as done. Um, so work as imagined is what we all collectively think um, happens out there on our work sites. Um, work as done is actually what does happen. Um, work as prescribed um, is what happens and what is stated in standards, etc. And work as disclosed is, is what we are told happens out there. And you can see that very small bit in the middle. Um, that's where it all comes together. So that's the utopia. Um, and the aim of safety two is to expand that area in the middle. So work as imagined and work as done um, comes together um, and you're closing that gap. I'll give you a, a real life um, example of what I mean by that. So for instance, um, I do a lot of work in the industry on fatigue. And as part of that, uh, we, we adhere to the network rail standard, which stipulates a maximum of a 12 hour shift, uh, but also a minimum of a 12 hour rest between shifts. So if I use the example, uh, you take a single weekend shift, it has a two hour drive from an individual place of rest and is planned for 12 hours and it starts at midnight on Saturday. So a traditional um, weekend shift. For this scenario, we would have to leave home at 10 a.m. on Saturday to get to a hotel for midday, stay in the hotel for 12 hours and go to work, providing the hotel is very close to the work site and get there for, for midnight on Saturday. The shift finishes at mid, midday on Sunday, so we'd have to go back to the hotel and stay there until midnight on Sunday, leave the hotel and arrive home at two o'clock on Monday for one shift. And the biomathematical models don't don't suit this approach and in reality does that happen well absolutely not so you can see that there's a, a gap between workers prescribed and workers imagined uh, ver versus workers disclosed and workers done so we need to think pragmatically um, and consult uh, with the workforce um, and then use the biomathematical model um, to actually prove um, the shift systems and that's something that we're working with network rail on Consequences of getting it wrong um, are tragic, um, and we've spoke about a few fatalities um, already this afternoon. Um, this is another one. Um, so this um, involves um, a welding firm, um, renowned consultants, that were recently fined uh, £450,000 with £300,000 of costs for failing to ensure that two of its workers were sufficiently rested to work and travel safely. Um, they'd been instructed to take on an extra job following a night shift. Um, sentencing brought uh, the end to a very complex case in which uh, Zach Payne, who was 20 years old, um, and Michael Morris, who was 48 years old, um, and an ex-colleague of mine, uh, they died on the 19th of June 2013 while travelling in, in a company van. Um, in the early hours of the morning, their van crashed into a parked articulated lorry. The judge um, summed up and said that Renown's grave, gravest failing was to perform a suitable and sufficient risk assessment on the day before the fatalities, which led to the company failing to comply with its own fatigue management procedures. So again, you can see that work as described, um, it's there, the procedures are there, but it's very different to work as done um, and work as imagined. Um, close remarks, he said the operations and managers um, knew what they were supposed to do in relation to fatigue, but paid lip service to it. Senior operations cut corners and I found a blindness in relation to people driving to and from jobs. This was the first time the UK rail regulator has brought about prosecution in relation to failures of fatigue management and it actually took seven years um, to get to this point. But I just wanted to use it as quite a tragic example um, to try and really demonstrate what I mean. Okay, so moving into, into Volker Rail. Um, so the way that we um, manage HSQES um, is that we have our overall plan, we have our goal areas, um, and we have our objectives, um, which you can see in that rather nice little pictorial there. This afternoon, I'm just gonna briefly um, describe um, all of what that means. Um, so we enhance the arrangements for planning and taking isolations on 25 kV OLE equipment, as we've just heard, um, to reduce isolation incidents during the testing of OLE 
and application and removal of earths. Um, so one of um, the previous presenters' examples was Harlow Mill. Harlow Mill was when I first started um, with Grant Rail, um, and that was a real wake-up call um, as to you know the dangers of OLE equipment to me being very new to the railway. Um, reviewing the effectiveness of, of the network rail plant operator scheme. Um, introduce a process that clearly defines who's responsible for checking the sites prior to operations resuming, providing greater assurance that the infrastructure is fit for trains. So this is not the, the A to G handback process. Um, this is additional. Um, and this came to a fore uh, a few years ago uh, on a job that we was on where we actually left a um, quite a large um, pile in the forefoot. Um, which was discovered by a, a tamper that was leaving the work site, unfortunately for us. Um, so this is a process that we've introduced. Review the effectiveness of, of management arrangements and interfaces between um, people and plant, uh, which is a big one and it's a key risk for us, um, as is on the railway. Um, improve the management arrangements associated with delivery and collection of plant equipment and materials. Um, this is usually involving people that are not used to the railway, um, so it's absolutely our responsibility to control those activities. Um, enhancement of site safety in and around excavations. Um, implement an effective change management process to ensure that changes to our assets, operations, process or organisations does not adversely affect health and safety management and risk control. This is so important. Um, this is something that we've embedded within the business. Um, it's a validation process um, that follows the same sort of principles as the CSM, um, but it's absolutely vital to understand um, and have this implemented before any changes are made. Um, and the improvement of the control of contractors and suppliers. Um, this is a particular area of weakness. Um, we embed uh, our own personnel uh, and we must absolutely do the same with our supply chain. So a couple of more specific examples, um, QR code technology, um, it's nothing new and I'm sure most of you um, have something very similar, um, but this is under our cultural goal. Um, and the reason I'll include this one this afternoon is the use of, of QR code technology has been um, fundamental for us um, in a bit of a shift change in reporting. Um, from moving from a paper-based system for cards in, in letter boxes, etc., which never really worked very well. Um, within the first three months um, of introducing QR code reporting, and we saw a 400% increase um, in close calls being reported, and that's been maintained throughout. So we put the QR codes on, on our task briefings, um, on posters in site access um, cabins, etc., pretty much everywhere. Um, and they are location specific um, and you can upload pictures etc and it really tells a good story um, and it enables us to act upon these in real time as they go through to our control center. Another one is um, haveware technology um, so this is under health and well-being um, and this is looking um, to reduce the effects of haves um, through monitoring um, interesting one, this um, because this is the sort of the, almost like the last point um, on the on the triangle. There, um, we do a huge amount of work with regards to the elimination of, of vibration and vibratory tools. Um, one example is we do a lot of work on on tramways, um, and the old method of, of embedded rail was to to cut through into the concrete um, and to use a pole scabbler. Um, if anyone's seen a pole scabbler in operation, they are horrendous. Um, it almost looks like a cartoon uh, where someone's holding on to a piece of equipment and the whole body is vibrating. We've moved away from that and we've got a dedicated bit of kit um, that's a remote control operation um, and the tolerance that it gives you is much improved. But there is a still, still a need um, to, to use this sort of technology to actually record real-time vibration um, from a claims defensibility point of view, but more importantly for the education of the workforce so they understand the effects of vibration um, and they can adequately control it themselves um, with their supervisor's assistance. Um, investigating accidents, incidents and close calls. Um, over a number of years we've invested heavily in this. Um, we actually have a um, an internal bespoke IOSH accredited um, incident investigation course running um, and we've put through about 50 people um, through that already. 
Um, this is under our learning objective. Um, this is bespoke, so this um, sees the, the delegates actually out on track um, with regards to recording evidence, um, gathering evidence and preserving, etc. Um, it's been a real success story um, through investigations um, and the root cause analysis using barrier analysis and step analysis. Um, we really get down to the root causes. Um, in addition to this, um, we run a, a, a initial responders one day course um, for more site supervisors um, who might be on site so they can do the, the preservation of evidence, the witness statement taking, etc. And then on top of this, we do a, a quarterly review session. Um, so we, we look back at the investigations that have been completed um, and we peer review these. Um, we do refresher training, but we also do an annual technical review, uh, which is with all the trained investigators to make sure that there isn't um, a degree of skills fade. Because obviously the end goal is, is for not to do investigations, for not to have the incidents. Um, so we just need to make sure that people's competence is, is up to date um, and they are confident when undertaking investigations. Um, obviously our business would be nothing without our people. Um, recognition is absolutely fundamental to, to everything that we do. Um, and we run AIM Awards, so AIM is Attitude, Influence and Management. Um, and every month we have a, a really good selection um, of applications um, to the AIM Awards. Um, and these are from the different categories. So they, they look at quality, they look at health and safety, they look at environment. And it's really looking at you know what people do um, and go over and above um, to really accelerate our business in terms of culture. Um, and we reward on a monthly basis. We publicise this, um, and it's been a real great success for us. Um, I couldn't um, do a presentation in the current climate without talking a little bit about um, COVID-19 and the risk controls. Very early on um, in April, um, we introduced the, the COVID-19 Marshall um, concept, um, which is something that we shared with the industry. Um, that's worked really, really well for us. And that's just having a dedicated person on site to make sure social distancing is in place, um, to make sure that sanitizing equipment is, is up to good stock levels and everything that we've put in place through the risk assessment process is available on being adhered to. It's not a policing role, it's more of a gentle reminder and we've not come down heavy because it's human nature for people to come together. Um, so it's just that gentle reminder, but it's worked incredibly well. Um, interestingly, um, it took uh, a bigger effort to get people back to the offices when we were allowed um, for that brief period um, than it does um, with regards to maintaining um, full operations on site. Um, and we introduced 12 golden rules um, we introduced an animated video as a, a bit of a reintroduction back into the office. Um, and that was done before we actually allowed people back in. Uh, and we'll do the same again. Um, but that's just people, just to give people the confidence in, in coming back um, in that everything is in place um, and we're looking out for their well being. With regards to well being, um, it's vitally important that we've kept in touch with everybody, um, kept them up to date with what's going on. And we have opened up the offices in certain, certain circumstances to the individuals that are really struggling with working from home. And it's just about protecting our people, doing the right thing, and it's not a one size fits all. So again, uh, there's just a couple of pictures of the things that we did. So face fit testing, um, we had to obviously revise our face fit testing regimes. Um, to make sure that we could still undertake those operations. Uh, we used forced fed um, air respirators in certain circumstances. Um, so for instance, location, um, rooms, etc. But what was really pleasing for me is, is the workforce coming up with um, innovation um, to keep social distancing. And so i.e. one of the biggest things was, was tools and equipment and lifting out tools and equipment. Um, and you can just see, you know, it's really simple, it's really basic, but it's effective um, in just coming up with different ideas into how um, a two-man lift um, for a half-track trolley there um, can be done. So really, just to, to summarise, um, for us uh, as a business, um, it's about industry collaboration and company activity, and, and the two go hand in hand. So with regards to industry, um, the roadmap there um, for industry delivers um, and drives the collaborative development of good practices. 
and that then feeds into to our own um, business plans, um, health and safety plans, etc. And that gets implemented, and that data um, from our company and from other principal contractors then gets combined, monitored at industry level to drive strategic level activity. Overall, it's a risk-based approach at both industry um, and company level. The two are intrinsically linked, um, and the, the two support each other. So. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate it. And again, uh, Valkyrie Rally is ever so pleased to be able to sponsor this event this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It was another very interesting presentation. Um, I'm currently working in the South Wales Systems Alliance, so I can relate to a lot of things you're talking about there um, from an operational perspective. So I did say earlier on, we're, we're not going to have any questions uh, just now, but please, if you do have any, please submit them through either the question or the chat function, and Stuart will come back to you on a one-to-one -one basis. So we've now reached the halfway point, and we're going to have a break um, for 15 minutes. So time to grab a cup of tea or coffee, and we shall reconvene at 14.40. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully you've all had time to have suitable refreshments and ready to listen to, to the next series of presentations. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Gerhard Dole, who's the Managing Director for TrackSure. And TrackSure are our other sponsor today, our second sponsor, so we're very grateful to them for their support. So Gerhard joined the startup TrackSure in 2003 where he has been able to develop the business globally with his passion to improve safety by introducing innovation to the world's railways. His experience in the rail industry came from his time at Thermit Industries, particularly during an extensive period of learning as MD for their Australian business. Following the Thermit Challenge, Gerhardt worked as financial controller at Goldsmith, a sister company of Thermit, and then moved on to become General Manager of Finance and Administration at Evobus, which is part of Daimler. Again, please note there's no specific uh, question slot after this presentation, but if you would like to ask any questions, just submit them anyway, and, and Gerthardt will come back to you on an individual basis. Thank you. Over to you, Gerthardt. Welcome. Yeah, how do you just need to unmute yourself? Gerhard, we've still got a problem with it's sound. Not, uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. And I'm going to be talking to you about bolt science in regards to track bolts, how it directly impacts on track worker interventions and safety. And that the range of traction fasteners that are approved and used can help to reduce track interventions and therefore contribute to a safer railway. This was also very clearly expressed by Nick in his earlier interesting presentation. Yeah. Um, Kate, where is my presentation on the laptop? Sorry. Ah. In terms of the ballast, we all understand it refers to worker safety by way of avoiding unnecessary track visits. Now, rail operators put enormous efforts into improving safety standards, but sadly, there are still, for example, 50 to 100 railway employee fatalities around Europe each year, and also three UK fatalities and 130 major injuries. Yeah, in the light of the sad news that Joanne referred to at the start, yeah, these statistics are very real, and I'm really sorry what happened today. I think it is indisputable that less track interventions will reduce risks to staff. This is a normal bolt, probably one of the most commonly used metal fasteners. It comes in many different shapes and sizes, is made from a variety of different materials and used in multiple applications. When subjected to significant changes in temperature, the parts being held together by a nut and bolt will contract and expand, causing the nut on the bolt to loosen. When trains run over the track, the resulting vibration will cause the nut to loosen further. The effect of vibration can be quite substantial, as this following video will show. Well, this model mimics with the use of a small electrical motor, the same kind of vibration happening when a train passes a bolted joint in track, inevitably causing the fitted nut to vibrate off the bolt. For those of you who haven't not yet heard of our product. I would just like to explain 
how it works to facilitate my latest slides. Traxxer is a fail-safe nut locking system used in conjunction with an approved standard nut and bolt. The independent mechanical traction device is secured using an additional left-hand nut, um, left-hand threaded nut, screwed onto a left-hand threaded extension to the bolt, a stainless steel cover locks both nuts together to eliminate any possibility of either nut self-loosening in service. It is simple to service, requiring only standard spanners to fit or remove. It is very robust, reusable, and easily adjustable to take up any settlement. The following fitting video shows how it is applied in track applications. Okay, could you bring in the video, please? Thank you. Tractual is a simple product to fit and service. Fit the Tractual bolt. And tighten the right hand nut to the prescribed torque standard. Then fit the Tractual nut to the left hand thread. Ensure there is no gap between the two nuts as we have illustrated in this incorrect fitting. Torque to the prescribed standard, 100 newton meter in this instance. Check that the cover fits over both nuts, if necessary, by tightening further the traction nut. Fit the spring clip, apply a little grease to the inside of the cover, and push the cover over both nuts. The two nuts do not need to align, as the serrated cover has 24 correct fitting positions. Are we able to put the presentation back now? Are you okay there, Gerhard? Not too sure what's happened. I just don't know where it is at the moment. No. We shall wait for the wonders of Kate. She will be able to fix it. She fixes everything. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah. There we go. So, Traxxer 100% eliminates any nut loosening caused by vibration. The nut simply cannot move. It is my contention that we reduce track interventions. Currently, there are regular inspections on bolts, sometimes as often as every 24 hours, highlighting a high risk of bolt loosening. Rail operators are currently trying to resolve this challenge simply by increasing inspection and maintenance, demonstrating the challenges in the market. Now, I'd like to focus on bolt science and show independent tests done with new and used bolts, of which the results can be applied uh, to rail applications. Maintenance and inspection is important for safety, but we want to avoid it in excess. There is a design challenge with bolts, as the reliability of bolted joint is dependent on three parameters. The joint design, component quality, and achievement of the design clamp load in application. This graph shows the achieved preload on a new N22 bolt when torqued. This bolt, in this example, is specified on a heavy commercial vehicle and is usually torqued 
to 650 newton meter. As the torque increases, the clamp load goes up. And at 650 newton meter, there's a clamp load of 190 to 250 newton meter present in the bolt. The graph also shows that there is a high tolerance, even on new bolts achieved as on the clamp load achieved even with new bolts. However, this high this high clamp load should prevent self vibration loosening of nuts. It is very important to achieve and maintain this high preload to eliminate failures from fatigue and nut vibration loosening. 90% of all bolted joint failures can be attributed to insufficient bolt tension, which contributes to this self vibration loosening. And I think now the poll question will come in, Kate. Thank you. What average clamp load can be expected once the bolt has been serviced 10 to 20 times over a period of three to five years? Is it unchanged? Is it perhaps 25% less or 40% less or even more than 50%? Okay. Yeah, the answer is it's over 50%. And in some cases, uh, individual use bolts were down even 70% on the clamp load in comparison to use uh, to new bolts. Now, this graph shows an independent laboratory test of 10 new M22 bolts against four sets of 10 used bolts, where each set varied in condition. Now, for example, the uh, 10 new bolts shown on the top line deliver an average preload of 21 tons as expected. But the test with used bolts and rusty nuts and no oil at the bottom line show dramatically reduced clamp loads. Now, the normal distribution curve on standard deviation for used bolts show a much wider uh, spread in comparison to the new bolts. And this means that approximately 75% of used bolts have insufficient clamp load in the bolt. Now, this graph shows an example of what is happening in the industry when prevailing torque nuts are used on a new M24 bolts in this instance. The top line shows the free running nut torqued on the 600, with 650 newton meters achieves 160 kilo newton preload. But only 6.5 tons is achieved with the prevailing torque nut as there's much more friction involved in the threads. In conclusion, I want to say that the vast majority of bolted joints are tightened in the prescribed manner but the problem is that the achieved bolt tension after tightening in track remains unknown and creating the root cause of nut loosening or adverse bolt breakage. Now, additional factors acting on the joint include joint settling, high vibration, incorrect tightening, as individuals simply have different levels of strength. Any one or more factors in combination with insufficient clamp load mean self vibration loosening of the nut is inevitable. That's why rail operators are required to implement regular inspections and maintenance procedures to keep up the safety standards. Now, let's apply this old science to some rail applications. For example, freezer switches, a spring loaded bolt torque until the spring is compressed to one millimeter 
the insufficient clamp load will always cause self not loosening or the spring to break. Also, expansion joints and fish blades shown on this picture. The bolts are taught generally only to 30% of its proof load to allow the ray to expand in the joint. And this movement will always cause nut loosening unless the main nut is locked permanently in position to maintain the clamping distance, as well as switches and crossings. There are a number of components clamped together. The bolts can settle under the axle load, causing the loss in preload and resulting in nut loosening and potentially bolt breakage. Innovative products like ours have multiple applications that can minimize excessive inspections carried out to prevent these failures. Some more pictures of applied technology. For example, the picture on the top left shows a retarder where brake segments are fitted with M24 bolts, but with rapid inserts to reduce noise pollution, meaning the bolts cannot be torqued properly to achieve sufficient preload to prevent nut loosening. Some OEMs have already, uh, are already supporting our new technology demonstrating that they have taken a step forward to improve safety standards through technology, eliminating the root cause of the problem with a long-term solution. Some of the partners we're already working with are on this slide. Now to summarize, I would just like to reiterate that every track intervention eliminated reduces the risk of injury and fatalities, operational complexity, and frees up valuable labor and costs, particularly when budgets are constantly cut, as Steve pointed out in his presentation earlier on. Ultimately, Treasure is very keen to create a safer railway. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gerhard. That was certainly a very different, um, different view of safety but all valid, all valid. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. So again, just to remind anyone, if you would like to ask any questions, please put them in the chat function for the questions and Gertrude will come back to you on an individual basis. I'm now going to, so thank, thank you Gerhardt. Very much indeed. I'm now going to move on to our next presenter, which is in change of direction again slightly. So uh, we've now got Mick James, who's the Senior Approvals Engineer for Placer UK. So Mick joined British Rail as a craft apprentice in 1970. Following night school and various training posts, Mick became HST Engineer at Lara Depot in 1981, and then Services Manager Plymouth, followed by Plant Engineer Great Western Trains, and subsequently T&RS Technical Engineer for First Great Western. In 2002, Mick joined RSSB and became Principal Plant Engineer in 2005. Mick retired in 2015, but is employed part-time by Plasa UK and retains chairmanship of several European Standards Working Group. So, welcome, Mick. Welcome, good afternoon. Ah, there we go. Yes, it's working. Um, so, what I was, um, wanted to talk to you about this afternoon uh, is, is machine safety. And, and uh, obviously, to, to be safe, the, the operator has to be uh, competent to use the to machine, uh, motivated to want to use it properly, and disciplined uh, in order to operate it correctly. All of these, are, which are the subjects of a, a presentation in their own right, um, to be used safely, a machine has to be able to be used safely, or in other words, it has to be designed to be safe. So machine safety by design is, the, is this talk. Um, and <clears throat> I'll start off with explaining the legislation involved and, and uh, for railway machinery uh, and how that uh, gives way for, for standards um, for, for the railway machines 
uh, the different types of machines, how they relate to those standards, um, and finally some examples of, of what it is these, these standards in, include. Uh, but just to, to start, before we go to that, uh, I'd just like to introduce you to um, three possible modes of existence for the machine, three possible states of being for, for a railway machine. Um, those are running, working and travelling. Uh, if we go to, to running, um, running mode is when the machine is moving from um, Birmingham to London. On ordinary track, it's in amongst other trains, so it has to uh, interact with the signalling system. The driver uh, sitting in the cab obviously has to see ahead to, to see the signals, uh, or the machine is towed, in which case it would be a wagon, uh, in terms of um, whilst it's been in its running mode. And most importantly, the machine has to be within gauge and absolutely ensured to be within gauge. So that's running mode. Um, now obviously, we, we actually have these machines to do something. So they're, they've got a working mode um, and they do that in a, in a site protected from the rest of the railway. Um, so the movements on the site are not controlled by signals, but by the engineering control of the site. Uh, and obviously, um, quite a lot of machines don't uh, stay with engage when they're working. That's not to say that they can just do um, anything, obviously working adjacent line open to, to a, a running railway, you have to protect it from that. But it doesn't have to stay with engage and many machines don't. So that's working mode. And then there's something in between that. So when it's moving between work sites, so it's still within a possession in uh, UK speak, um, but moving between uh, different work sites, uh, and that uh, can be several miles apart at times. Um, the machine uh, doesn't, is still only controlled, the movements are only controlled by the engineer, there's not signaled. But the machine in this case has to be within gauge. So if we remember those three modes of operation, it makes uh, some more sense of what it is we're going to talk about. Um, so a machine that actually has a running mode, uh, like our good old friend the Tampa, um, is an on-track machine. Um, now we come to the, the, the legislative bit. Um, and what do we have to do to, to actually place an on-track machine onto the market in Europe? So actually, it just put it into the uh, shop window to sell it. Uh, well, in running mode, it's a railway vehicle. Um, and therefore, it has to comply with the interoperability directive. The interoperability directive uh, requires a third party assessment. Um, so you have a NOVO assessed to ensure that it meets the interoperability directive. And actually the interoperability directive is, is a bit, um, I don't know whether it's unique, but certainly very, very unusual amongst uh, legislative requirements, legislative directory, directives, in that it has a technical specification for interoperability. There's several of those that explain what you need to do to meet the directive. Uh, and certainly in terms of a uh, track machine, the, the biggest single one is the um, TSI for lock and pass, um, which is OT, OTM is within the scope of that directive, uh, that uh, TSI. Uh, but there are other bits of other TSIs that um, also apply to on-track machines. Now, with any directive, any European directive, it's possible to have a a uh, standard uh, which is harmonized to, to the directive or part of the directive, a clause within the directive, so that you can actually, if you meet the standard, you can claim a presumption of conformity to that part of the standard. Um, and lo and behold, for on track machines, such a standard exists, and it's EN 14033, part one. So if you comply with 14033 part one, 
um, then you can claim a presumption of conformity to the interoperability directive. But still talking about placing it on the market, um, it's certainly when it's in its um, working mode and uh, traveling mode, it's a machine. So therefore it has to comply with the machinery directive. Now for the machinery directive, um, the manufacturer self-certifies that he meets the directive, um, other than a few um, odd machines that are, um, the, there's a no-bo approval, for example, MUPS are in that sort of ball game. But we're, we're talking about on-track machines, so here we're talking about manufacturers uh, self-certify to the machinery directive. Again, it's possible to have a harmonized standard to, to meet the machinery directive. Indeed, it's, it's very common with the machinery directive to have um, standards that you can claim a presumption of conformity of meeting the machinery directive. And of course, we have such a standard for on-track machines. That standard is EN 14033 part three. Uh, now we get to, we've sold the machine, now we want to use it. Um, and uh, in running mode, it's a railway vehicle, and so therefore has to comply now with the railway safety directive. Um, and that requires the railway undertaker or the people that's driving it um, to uh, compatibility assessment for the route that it's on. Um, so we talk about uh, gauge, uh, e the electro uh, uh, ECR, um, also L, the, the machine will actually fit on the route. And in working and travelling mode, it's, they also has to comply with the uh, railway safety directive, um, and the, you have the common safety method. Um, or compensatory methods um, underneath the safety directive uh, and in this one particularly the risk assessment and evaluation is a nice hand in glove with the machinery directive to do the design assessments um, to make sure the machine is safe. Now also uh, a machine uh, will require product acceptance um, principally by the infrastructure manager to ensure that it's uh, okay to use on his line. But it, or, and probably and, also by the people that are going to operate the machine, because they need to make sure that the machine is safe for use by their employees under PURE, the provision and use of work equipment regulations, they have a duty of care for their employees. And, Thankfully, there is a standard that uh, will assist in meeting these requirements, uh, and it's part two of 14033. Uh, and also, there's quite a few of the uh, parts of, in uh, part three that uh, will assist in, in uh, meeting the requirements for uh, the pure regulations. So, we have the standard uh, for uh, on track machines actually in four parts. Uh, part one is, is in running mode, part two are the technical requirements in working and travelling mode, part three are the safety requirements, and there's also a fourth part that if you wanted to use the machine on urban rail. So as we've said, parts one and three give the presumption of conformity to the directives, part two gives the, uh, will assist you in meeting the product acceptance, uh, and part four is the optional part if you want to use it to, to meet the urban rail and explains all the differences that you will find for urban rail. Um, so as we've said, to be able to use uh, on-track machine on the site, uh, it, it has to comply with the machinery directive, which is uh, self-certified to part three. Uh, it has to comply with the interoperability directive uh, and the safety directive. Uh, which is uh, EM4033 part one, and that you gain in British, in British parliaments, you gain acceptance from the ORR to actually import the machine. And it also has to be safe to use, which is the important part we're talking about here. Uh, and that's your product acceptance, and that's the second part of 14033. 
And of course, what you end up with inevitably are three certificates to show that your machine was designed safely. Um, the EU Declaration of Conformity, uh, Engineering Conformance Certificate, and your Product Acceptance Certificate. So that ensures that your machine is safe. There's all, but there's all sorts of machines um, from the uh, very small, uh, the sort of um, what are commonly called as motorized buggies, up to the very, very big um, machines that can actually um, renew a whole railway underneath themselves. Uh, so how do we uh, decide what standard um, to actually use to, to say is our machine? Um, and so the machines we're, talk, we're talking about here are machines with rail wheels. Uh, and if we ask ourselves some very simple questions, we can decide what standard a, mach a machine is, should be designed to. So we'll start off with asking the question, is it designed and intended to interact with signals? So has it got a running mode? And if the answer is no, ask, can it move on ground and rail? So in other words, it's got road wheels and rail wheels. If the answer is no, can it be manually moved only? So do you have to push it over the track? And if the answer to that is yes, then it's a trolley and is, is the EN3 13977. If it's not manually moved, then it must be self-propelled or towed by another vehicle. So it's a demountable machine or a trailer, and then it's uh, 15955. Going back up to the um, question about ground and rail, if it can move along the ground as well, is it self-propelled? Yes, well, in which case it's a road rail vehicle, road rail machine and it's EN 15746. If it's no, then it's a road rail trailer and it comes underneath the trailer standard, 15955. So going right the way back up to uh, design intended to operate signaling, um, again, can it move on the ground and rail? If the answer to that is no, then it's an on-track machine as we've already talked about, and that's uh, 14033. And if the answer to that is yes, uh, then it's a road rail vehicle uh, and is 15746. But you say, in this country, we don't allow um, uh, machines to actually uh, go, or road rail vehicles to actually go outside of a possession. So actually, it makes the, the, draw, the, the whole diagram much simpler in this country because we don't allow RRVs outside of a standard, outside of a possession. So we now know uh, what standard applies, but why would we do it? Well, we've already said that it's a, it's a, a legislative requirement, um, but actually we want to do it because we want to avoid accidents. So we want to stop the machine from running away. Um, so braking requirements, and if we, if we look at a trolley, and this is some work being done uh, to, to uh, to actually prove the, the trolley braking requirements. And if you think about a trolley, um, the, the variables that we can talk about are the load, the speed at which the trolley is released, the um, slope or the gradient that it works on. And also for a trolley, you can talk about whether it's wet or not. Because for trolleys, for such small brakes, um, wet rails make a big difference. Um, so we can boil that down to the requirements actually being um, all we need to do is prove that on a gradient of 40 per mil, that's one in 25 in imperial speak, um, uh, you do let the trolley go at uh, six kilometers an hour um, and on a dry rail it has to stop within 10 meters and on a wet rail within 14 meters. And there's a little sting in the tail because there is also the maintenance requirement that it has to stay within those tolerances for its lifetime. Um, so that's uh, braking. Uh, here's an RRV in a, in a sort of position where you don't want it. Um, they're not designed to lay down to rest. Um, and the thing about uh, uh, an awful lot of the lifting that we do uh, on the railway it tends to use um, hydraulic excavators 
much more than than cranes um, and so st stability of hydraulic excavators is proved by tests according to the standard where all possibilities of movement and bearing in mind a hydraulic excavator can have three piece jibs so the the jib can be either full forward or full back which has a big difference um, on unfavorable position of the machine so rotationally round it uh, worst case combination of track twist and gradient um, and then from that position you start you can the safe working load is 90 percent of the load that would cause the first rail wheel to lift or 75 percent of the load that would cause the second rail wheel to lift that's hatched that requirement has actually driven a behavior within manufacturers now to do testings uh, they've built special rigs to actually to do this testing and you can see one here um, where the machine is sat on a turntable um, so that you can do any position rotationally uh, and it's it's uh, it lifts up and the rails on the turntable um, are capable of being moved by hydraulic jack so you can move them into any position so you can have the four different heights to take account of uh, gradient cant and a track twist um, and you can prove when it is the rail wheels lift and then therefore set up a safe of uh, the safe working load for each one of those machines so the machine itself has to be fitted with a safe lo working load indicator limiter so that's those are examples of um of, of design for safety um so thank you very much and uh, are there any questions so thank you very much, and, and Dave Mick, that was very interesting, certainly gave us a different perspective um, from some of the other subject areas we've heard about today. I'll just check in and see what we've got in the question box. Um, I've got one question here. So it's a common complaint that complying with standards adds unnecessary cost. What's your view on that, please? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I've certainly heard that before. Yes, <laughs> uh, unnecessary cost. I would I would defend that and say no, they're not unnecessary costs. Obviously, for example, fitting the uh, RCI adds a cost, but I would say that's necessary because you don't want the thing on its side. Um, where costs do tend to come in, and where the biggest complaint is, is where people have designed and built a machine and then decided to see whether it meets the standard or not at that point retrospectively designing inevitably adds costs but if you des design it from the start to meet the standard you're wanting it to meet then you know it's, it's it costs the same either way yes yes indeed indeed thank you so we don't seem to have any other questions oh we're well, sorry we do there, are, there is a question coming in now so this is from andy franklin to what extent do the standards mentioned require the building of safeguards against operator error? Absolutely. The, the one thing that um, you have to do is um, take cognizance of what could possibly happen. Um, so I've always said that it's absolutely impossible to make a machine um, totally uh, foolproof because if somebody, the, the malicious can always um, um, outweigh what you want to do. What you have to do is make it very difficult for him and actually make it uh, so that why would you want to do that? So you design the machine so that it's easy to use um, and uh, um, you protect the unwary, but you can't stop the malicious. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Hopefully, Andy, that's answered your question. And we have another question in now from, well, it's a comment really, from Mike Barlow. Standards help to control risk. Do what it says in the standard and you know that risks are tolerable and allow. Of course, it is quite possible to go outside of standards, but this needs to be done in a controlled way. And I'm sure, yes, we would all agree with those comments from Mike. Yes. Yes, thank you, Mike, for that. So I think uh, that's all the questions we, we've got at present, Mick. So thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I will now turn to our next speaker, who is Kerry Dolan, uh, Membership Manager from Cyrus. 
So Kerry worked for RSSB in various roles between 1997 and 2015. She was initially employed by Railway Safety, and this was before it became the Rail Safety and Standard Board, as a conference manager until 2008, when she then moved internally into a program manager role, focusing on railway community safety. In 2015, Kerry moved to Cyrus, where she became the membership manager, a post she still holds today, looking after nearly 1,900 Cyrus members. So welcome, Kerry, and um, over to you with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope that you're all safe and well. Um, as Joan said, I'm Kerry Dolan, and I'm the membership manager for Cyrus. Um, I'm very grateful for the PWI for being given this opportunity to speak with you all today. And hopefully you'll all go away having learned something new about Cyrus. So we've got 20 minutes. There we go. So I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of Cyrus and also speak about how confidential reporting can help when it comes to asset integrity. All will become clear, hopefully. Um, so we'll get on with the presentation. So I'm sure in the audience today, we've got people that may be just starting their careers in the railway and others that have been in the industry for a long time, potentially some people that are retired. So just so that we're all on the same page, I'll give you a quick whistle-stop tour of Cyrus. Um, Cyrus is an independent, not-for-profit confidential reporting service for transport, logistics and infrastructure businesses. We're mission-led and our focus is on improving safety for workers and passengers so that we can all go home safely every day. So how do we do this? Well, we do this by providing a reporting channel so that staff can speak up in complete confidence about health, safety and well-being issues. And by providing this channel, we ensure that concerns can always be heard. I think it's helpful to say what we are and what we're not, as this helps debunk a few of the myths and inc incorrect perceptions that are out there. Now, we are 100% confidential. Since our inception in 1996, we've not had a breach in confidentiality. We're not in competition with other reporting channels, for example, internal channels. What we do is seek to complement these channels by providing another option for staff to use. Our motto, if you like, is it doesn't actually matter where you report it, just make sure you report it. We have just under 1,900 members from across the industry, but we are entirely independent. Cyrus acts as a facilitator between the company and the reporter. Now, just so I'm clear, uh, the reporter is the person that comes to us with the concern, comes to make the report. We don't investigate and we don't act as a regulator. The investigation, if there's any, is done by the company receiving the report. When we're out and about, quite a lot we hear the term whistleblower. Cyrus isn't a whistleblower, that's quite a different um, thing. Whistleblowing tends to be highlighting wrongdoing, whereas we at Cyrus seek to facilitate positive changes. And the reporting process is easy to use, and I know I'm biased and I would say that, but, and I can't go into the um, real detail of it today, but we do have a team of very highly trained reporting analysts. They'll interview the person who's raising the concern and write up the report. So all the hard work is done for, for the reporter. And finally, what we're not is a place where you can raise grievances or H HR issues. Um, so we can't help you get that pay rise, um, unfortunately. But joking aside, when we do have a concern that we're not able to process as a Cyrus report, we will always look to redirect the reporter to another appropriate channel and help support them to raise their concern in the right place. Now, we've already seen this triangle today. Um, I think Rob um, had a version of it. So I find it useful to use this pyramid to help demonstrate where confidential reporting fits into the grand scheme of things. So if we look at the top of the pyramid, here's where an accident or an incident has actually happened. And we can use these events to learn and try and prevent it happening again. Often before these events, there are the 
precursor incidents, the near misses or the close calls, and we've heard quite a lot about those kind of things today. This is where the event has nearly happened. These can act as early warning and we can look at what they're telling us and put preventative measures in place. Finally, we have the bottom level of the pyramid. Now, these are often considered minor issues and could be overlooked. Things like unsafe conditions or acts that don't actually result in anything happening, but could be a precursor to those near misses or even an accident or an incident. This is where we receive most of our confidential reports. And these pieces of intelligence, if left unchecked, could actually lead to a safety incident. So if we can get these issues resolved, we can stop things happening, or potentially stop things happening higher up the pyramid. So I've covered a little bit about Cyrus. Now we can look at how it can play a role in reducing the risks associated with assets. Now, firstly, let me confess, asset integrity isn't my area of ex expertise, but I do know a big part of managing and monitoring asset integrity comes from our railway standards. These codify good practice into the industry's approach so that assets are looked after and the right level of effort is built into organisations' management systems. Data is also vital to improve safety and reliability, but effort needs to be applied to collect, analyse and understand all the data. And the trouble with the data is it's only as good as when it's captured, what gets analysed and what gets digested by those who make the decisions. The other really important component to all of this is the workforce, the people. We all know that safety isn't just about documentation, it is also about the people. And everyone needs to be involved in order to manage assets effectively. But my question is, are we able to hear everyone when we need to? You and your staff are the eyes and ears of the system. So one part of the solution is simple, it's the reporting. If you or your staff see something that doesn't look right, whether it's digital technology or physical infrastructure or rolling stock, it should be reported through operational or maintenance systems and industry systems such as SMIS, that's the Safety Management Intelligence Reporting, or NIR Online, that's the National Incident Reports. These systems are well established, as are procedures that are in place, so it can be quick and easy to re report issues, things like um, assets alia asset failures that threaten operations, broken rails or rolling stock faults. But what about the things that don't get reported to those systems? This is vital intelligence and we, mustn't, we must make sure that it just doesn't get lost. Oh, sorry, two went along. So what kind of things might not get reported? So some of these things are things that are not quite right, but have become normal. People get desensitized to the potential risks or things that seem like they're low priority and not worth raising. Then there are the things which people think might have been reported by others. Now, the consequence of someone reporting something twice are negligible, but actually the consequence of everyone thinking someone else has reported it could be catastrophic. Then we've got things where people don't feel confident to report because it's outside their expertise. They might worry about looking silly or stupid or actually not having got it right, what they're thinking. It's these kinds of reports where the untapped intelligence lies, and we need to create an environment in which we reduce the barriers to reporting these issues so that information like this can be heard. And this is where Cyrus can help. Cyrus can help by providing another channel whereby issues can be reported. If a worker is concerned about raising a concern internally for whatever reason, it's vital they have a place to go so this intelligence doesn't slip through the net. All workers across the rail sector have access to Cyrus. And as I mentioned in my introductory slide, and I think Joan mentioned it too, we've got nearly 1,900 members. We can take concerns from 
at the things that affect individuals or things that impact the system as a whole. And we like to think of, of ourselves as part of the reporting jigsaw, complementing other company and cross-industry reporting channels. As I said earlier, our motto is, it doesn't really matter where you report it, just report it. And this is how we can support asset integrity, by servicing intelligence that might help reduce the risks that might otherwise slip through the net. So when people do choose to raise issues confidentially through Cyrus, what kinds of concerns are related to assets? So we'll have a little bit of look at the data now. Last year in 2019-20, just over a third of our concerns related to assets and equipment. These were things relating to handheld tools, rail vehicles, lighting, software, and vegetation. As this table shows, the most common concern raised about equipment related to it being unsuitable, out of date, or having usability issues. And just to flag that this data covers all of our Cyrus members, so it includes data from the trams and the buses too. So reporters, that's, as I mentioned earlier, the person that comes to Cyrus to make the report, raise concerns about a range of assets under equip the equipment category. The most frequent shown here is being those being related to electrical and mechanical equipment. And you'll be familiar with the other categories in the table like PPE, uh, lights, health and wellbeing, um, things like computer equipment, phones, CCTV, CCTV and the radio, the digital stuff. Regarding the other category, this is related to equipment in one-off kind of cases. So this, um, for example, when we had a report on wheel arch brush brushes in buses and also lug luggage racks in trains. So they're kind of the one-off cases. When Cyrus reporters come to us, they're asked to explain to us or suggest what kind of improvements they're looking for when they report a concern. For equipment related reports, the most sought after outcome is improved health and well-being. And at this stage, just to give you a small insight into the reporting process, we raise the concern on the reporter's behalf, and this will also include that suggestion for an improvement. The report is then sent to the relevant company for a response. The company then investigates and takes action where appropriate. And then they provide a response covering any action they've taken, which is shared with the reporter. So we've got that full circle, that 360 degree, where the reporter eventually hears back um, what the company is doing. An example of a recent case raised um, a concern about pothole, potholes in a depot, and these led to them being fixed. Other concerns we hear about require more, more investigation such as occasional failures of radio communications on site, or potentially rework where the design or materials of an asset are raised as an issue. We do have concerns about, about vegetation, and um, that's another category of reports relating to assets, but the numbers of these are quite low. Typically, um, they're small. We received five last year and three in the year before. Um, and these cover things like foliage covering walkways used by track workers or overgrown foliage creating a visibility issue whereby track side signs um, have become obscured. Here is a more in-depth case study relating to an asset. A reporter came to Cyrus with a concern about malfunctioning screens on a station platform. This was a particular issue because they were driver opera only operated trains, so there was no dispatcher present. The issue had already been raised internally, but remained unresolved. The report was sent to Network Rail and the train operator, and as a result, the screens were fixed, and the train operator and Network Rail worked together to improve the dispatch process, and a further screen upgrade, uh, upgrade was planned in. So what was the impact? Well, improved driver visibility of the platform meant that there was less, less risk of passenger industry. This particular case appeared in our Frontline Matters newsletter um, back in August 2018. 
most reporters to Cyrus come because they come to us because they genuinely want to improve health and safety, but they don't feel able to report through other channels. As I said earlier, it's vital that these voices are heard. It's also worth noting that around a, a quarter of our concerns raised through Cyrus each year are third party. Now, this is a term we use when a person raises an issue for a company other than the, their own employer. So when you've got an industry that's characterized by interfaces, the ability to raise concerns irrespective of who needs to respond is critical. After all, we all share the same railway. Now, I've talked a lot about assets, but there are lots of different things you can report to Cyrus. And it's probably easier if um, I, I wouldn't ever think to prescribe a list because there's lots of different things related to rules and procedures, shift design, safety practices. What we like to say is that we will listen to any genuine health and safety concern. So once the issue has been addressed by the company and Cyrus has closed the loop with the reporter, the report is added to our Cyrus data bank. Here we can look for patterns and trends. This can provide an early warning of any emerging issues which have not yet become close calls or incidents and might not have been picked up through other channels. And linking this to other data sources creates an even bigger opportunity, one we're looking, already exploring with RSSB. Finally, we look to share our learning from our reports and related articles through our quarterly newsletter, Frontline Matters. You'll see on the screen here, there, there's um, an email address. So if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, please make a note of that and we can add you on. It's a really good opportunity to see um, what kind of reports we're hearing and also some of the articles on thematic topics. I said at the beginning that I hope you all learnt something new about Cyrus from this session, and I really hope that's the case. If you'd like to access any resources to encourage your people, your staff, your colleagues to report concerns, or you'd like more information on the intelligence in our data bank, please again feel free to contact us on the inquiry's email address. Or if you have any other questions, please do get in touch. Thanks ever so much for your time today. I appreciate this opportunity and I'm very happy to answer any questions you have um, if Joan would like to pose them. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, just conscious you're the only person that we haven't been able to see today because you had a problem with your video. Yes, sorry. Um, but, uh, no problem, no problem. It's just a bit strange for me not seeing you. Um, so, it's probably yeah. just as well. <laughs> Right. Any any questions, please, if you'd like to submit them in the uh, the question function or the chat would be super. Um, but I do have one question for you, uh, please, Kerry. So what percentage of people that come to Cyrus would you say have reported internally first and got no satisfaction from that? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Joan. Um, so it varies from year to year, but for example, last year, 72% of our reporters um, had reported internally first. Um, and when we asked them why they'd come to Cyrus, uh, the vast majority of them said that their internal channel hadn't provided a satisfactory response. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you that other things that are cited are things like the culture. Um, some, some people didn't um, feel that, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they'll be taken seriously and things like that. But the majority is that they didn't get their satisfactory response. And, and it is good to see that people will still then seek out an alternative way of raising their concern, isn't it? You know, rather than, than just giving up. So absolutely. That, that's very good, yep. Which is exactly yes, I guess, what you're there for, isn't it? So that, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the key. We keep kind of saying and um, plugging at the, the it doesn't matter where you report it, just report it. Um, and I think some people who uh, kind of think that if they get a Cyrus report, that's you know not a good thing. But actually, it's a it's a brilliant thing because they're hearing about something that they might not have heard about. Um, so that's that's the way we see it. Yes, absolutely. So we've got a question now in from Mike Barlow. Um, is there a Cyrus app which can be downloaded to mobile phones? <laughs> 
Uh, we don't have one at the moment, but that's very much um, something that we're in discussions about. Um, we're actually just looking into redoing our website um, and an app is definitely a, a future phase as part of that um, improvement in our technology. So good question. Okay. <laughs> It is a good question. It's quite common now, isn't it? You see the network real close call Very system. Much. You can you can um, yeah. get things in through the app through that. Um, and then a question in from Tian Tay, who funds Cyrus? Yes, that's a very good question as well. So um, we're a membership membership organisation. So we um, receive uh, membership fees from all our members. Um, and we are not for profit. So what we do is we look at our operating costs every year and divide it proportionately um, based on across all of our members. Um, and proportionately, I mean, um, you know, the larger organisations uh, have a higher membership fee than the smaller organisations, but it's all um, kind of across the whole membership. OK, that's great. Thank you. So we, we don't have any further questions, Kerry. So that's, um, thank you very much for your presentation. That was another very interesting aspect of, of safety. Thank um, you for giving me the opportunity. Been, been a broad church of information today. So that now brings us on to our final presentation of the day, um, which is going to be given by Jonathan Graham, who is an inspector with the Real Accident Investigation Branch. Um, not only is Jonathan a, an accident inspector, he's also their track specialist um, in that organisation. Prior to joining the branch almost four years ago, John spent five years working as the track asset manager for Nottingham Trams Limited. He has also held roles with Pandrel, White Young Green Engineering, and as a lead engineer for Curly and SNC Renewals on the West Coast Mainline. Aside from his day job, John now acts as the liaison between RAVE and the PWI, and he represents the branch of PWI's technical board. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Joan. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you to the PWI for inviting me along today. Um, so what I thought we'd talk about, yeah, a little bit of an introduction to RAIB for those of you who aren't aware of what we do, that might be very brief. Um, and then obviously uh, we have published our margin report in the last couple of weeks, so we'll talk a little bit about that, some of the findings, some of the things we've seen before, and some of the kind of key messages coming out of that. Um, now it's interesting how um, you kind of see threads running through presentations, and when Stephen was talking about major accidents earlier, um, one that wasn't on his list but is a key for the RAIB is Labrook Grove. Now Labrook Grove happened. Um, around the turn of the millennium and it was quite a difficult period for our industry because a lot of the incidents that you've heard Stephen talk about, Potter Bar, Hatfield, as well as ones like Labrador Grove, South Hall, Great Head, all happened in this period at the end of the 90s and into the 2000s um, where, let's be honest, the industry as a whole was, wasn't in a particularly great place. Um, and the inquiry into Labrador Grove made a number of recommendations and one of the key ones was the establishment of an independent accident investigation body, which is what the RAIB are. Um, our kind of mission statement, um, since everyone has to have one now, um, is to the investigation of accidents and incidents to improve railway safety, but also to inform people, and that's not just the industry but the public as well. So everything we've ever published is freely available, is available to absolutely anybody on the club.uk website. So if you ever want to read anything the RAIB have ever done, it's all there, ready and waiting. Um, in terms of the accident investigation that we do, we are fiercely independent. Um, we are independent of all other bodies. Although we are nominally part of the DFT, um, that is effectively more for payment and for just kind of general admin, we can still investigate our own boss if we have to, um, which is a bit of a strange position to be in, biting the hand that feeds, you might say. but. Um, fiercely independent and it's critical for the role that we have. But as part of that also, we don't establish blame or liability. So we're not there, we're not there to catch anyone out. We're not there to enforce the law. We're not there to prosecute people or to look for criminality. And that is where the police, the ORRs, the regulators come in. And um, so we're just looking at the safety improvements that can be made. And so each of the investigations that we do, that is the ultimate aim, is to improve safety on the railway got quite a broad scope um, as well as all of the main lines so from network rail from the 
far north of Scotland, all the way down to Cornwall. Um, all of Network Vale, plus Northern Ireland Railways and subways, metros, so London Underground, Glasgow Subway, all of the tram systems, light railways, um, the vast majority of the heritage sector, apart from some of the very small ones, um, and the Channel Tunnel up to the halfway point where we hand over to our French colleagues, although we've got a really good working relationship with them. Um, we've got a relatively small team, but we've always got at least five people on call, and that's two from Derby, two from Farnborough, plus kind of our, what we call the duty coordinator, it's a bit like a conductor. That person will be fielding the phone calls and deciding what people do. And that call, on call covers um, 365 days a year. And if something happens, we'll just get there as best we can. So a good example of that is the, uh, the Carmont Stonehaven development. We um, flew two people from Derby straight to Aberdeen. We sent another person from Farnborough straight away. And then we sent over the next day, we transported by train and by boat to bring equipment. So we just mobilised whatever we need. Um, we'll talk today particularly about track worker safety because A, it's the theme today with the heating drive, but also in light of the market report. But before we get on to kind of the present day, I think it's worth considering how far we've come. Um, about six months ago, Roy Hickman, who many of you will know, I'm sure, had dropped me an email and said, I've just found this in my garage, as you do, Roy. Um, and it's effectively the equivalent of the PTS handbook from 1968. And if you just read that very first paragraph, at least 30 civil engineering staff are killed every year. 30 a year. That figure seems absolutely inconceivable to us nowadays. And yet that isn't really all that long ago. So it's worth considering that we've actually made massive jumps in travel for safety over the last sort of 50 or 60 years. The other thing that I think is really important here is the messages that come immediately after that are just as valid today as they were then. Um, read that last paragraph. Take care for your own sake, for the sake of your family and dependents, for the sake of your mates, take care. I mean, that's still got a lot of validity now, and I think it's a really important message to remember that actually, as a community, we have a responsibility to each other, we have a responsibility to our loved ones, we have a responsibility to ourselves to look after ourselves. Now, if we come more to date, although we're not having 30 a year, we have still seen a significant number of fatalities over the years. Um, um, this is a graph showing um, track worker fatalities specifically, so that people working on or near the line, um, and the number of people who've unfortunately lost their lives while working on the railway. Um, it has been a general downward trend. And in 2014, um, a gentleman was struck in Newark Northgate, and by train, unfortunately, lost his life. And after Newark, we seem to be going into a spell where things are quieted down. Now, unfortunately, that trend has kind of been booked in the last few years by um, Stokes Ness, by Margaret, and then by Rowe. So we've actually lost all of our colleagues in the last two years, which is an awful place to be. And what I think the whole industry is hoping is this is, a, this is just a bump and isn't the start of a trend going onwards. Now, Um, just because there have been fewer fatalities of late doesn't necessarily mean that we're in a particularly amazing place because we've actually still on an awful lot of cases. This is ones that are serious enough for the RERB to be involved that have been published since the start of 2017. So basically about four years ago. And the three in green are our fatalities. And but you can see there's actually quite a long list. Now some of these are in really close. Um, the one at Sunder at the bottom right, gentlemen or two gentlemen there were within a second of being struck by a train, just managed to get out of the way. Clapham Junction was awfully close, someone having to dive out of the way there. Um, really, really sobering list that any of these could have been another market. So, although we've actually had a fairly decent reduction in fatalities, we've still had a lot of those precursor events and those dangerous occurrences at the top of the pyramid that we've seen. In the now, obviously, at the moment, our focus is on Margam. Now, um, we've published our Margam report, it came out in the last couple of weeks. Um, everybody on this call, I would really encourage you to read it. Um, obviously, it's an output from us, we're, we're very interested in people reading it, but just genuinely, as a snapshot of the industry and as a 
kind of a, a few points into what can actually go on out on track. It's a really interesting read. And ultimately, I think we've all got a responsibility because of the tragicness of Marvel to really give that a lot of serious consideration. It's available on our website, raib.co.uk. Um, I'm sure most of you know the scenario, but three gentlemen were still in the path of the train as it approached. Um, one of them very, very close to being struck, and unfortunately, the other two were struck. Um, Margot near Port Talbot. It's um, a very close knit workforce, almost like a family group. Um, it's been absolutely tragic for the people of Port Talbot in the broadest sense as well. Now, when we actually come to look at an event like Margam, obviously there's a, there's a lot of different ways we can investigate something like this, but Margam demanded a lot more attention because of the consequences. And so we looked at all the various ways we could look at what went on, and we investigated it from a number of angles. Now, most track worker fatalities or track worker uh, near misses, well, this kind of standard thing is we'll look at. We'll, we'll, we'll speak to the people involved, We'll look at uh, data sources, things like the on-train data recorder, which is a bit like a black box. It takes a bit for CCTV if it's available, doing site surveys, all those kind of things. And um, but we did a few other things on Margam um, because of the the importance of this investigation. One thing we did was we did a thematic analysis, and that is looking back at track worker incidents over the life of the RRB to look for common threads to see if there's anything that is running through all of those to, sit, yeah, to kind of find those common themes. We also engaged with Loughborough University and their Transport Safety Research Centre. Um, and they came in and did some um, some work for us. Now, some of that was fairly academic in nature, so literature reviews and some analysis. But what was really interesting um, as a way of doing this, we actually did focus groups. So we went out um, out to delivery units around the country, so we went to uh, a um, a selection of depots um, from different parts of the country, and we spoke to cossers, picks, and we actually had full and frank discussion with them. And those lasted two or three hours each. And what I will say is the cossers were not shy about giving us their opinions. In fact, they were very open, very honest, and positive and negative, but really, a really powerful way of seeing what it's actually like for people on the front line. Because I've got a good idea, I'm from that world, I kind of understand it. But even me going in there, I've realised that times have changed, times are a bit different. So hearing from the people that are actually doing the work weekend in town is really good. Now, with Margaret, what I'll do is I'll just kind of summarise what we found, but then I just want to pick out a few key themes. Um, so if you've read the report, if you've read a lot of the uh, press, or a lot of the reports from network I think you'll understand the incident quite well. So the kind of causal factors around the incident were very much focused around the team involved. So they were out on an open line, they were they were doing the job which which wasn't really necessary, or at the very least was at the very lowest priority. So almost to add to the tragedy, they were out there doing a job they really didn't need to be out in line traffic to do. Um, and these kind of unofficial methods of work started to creep in and the group split and then one half of the group went on without really formally appointing our look. And because they were using heavy they were using noise machinery, they had the independents on, they didn't hear the train coming. And essentially this kind of breakdown in the safety discipline of the group had gone on. And people were kind of challenging it a little bit, but there wasn't really a really strong challenge to the way that the team was working. And that's possibly down to this kind of dynamic within the group. Um, these guys work with each other week in, week out. They're very experienced. So there's almost like this kind of assumption that everyone's doing what they should be doing. But as well as those kind of factors around the group itself, we went to have a look at a lot of the underlying factors, the management factors, the organisational factors, and looking at kind of the industry as a whole, in particular focused around network mail because that's where this incident was. And we looked at the kind of conditions you would need to improve track worker safety, what, you know, what was going well, what wasn't going so well, and where can improvements be made. And these are the kind of four key threads we were, we were looking at. Now, one was around issue 01, then about um, standard 019, um, in particular around issue 9, we'll talk about that in a minute. An interesting one, the focus on technology over human and organisational factors, that is not in any way to say that bringing in new technology is bad, it is not, it's fantastic. You've seen from Nick's presentation earlier, 
some really, really innovative and fantastic ways of improving the safety of our workforce through the use of technology. But what we need to do is ensure that we don't just rely on that technology and at the expense of looking at the people who are working for us. Um, we'll talk a little bit about behaviours in a minute. Um, some of the other things were a bit more kind of what we'd expect. So monitoring for non-compliances, looking at when you can intervene as a manager. Um, one of the things we found with Margaret was that um, the assurance process was a lot of kind of self-assessment and to kind of use a bit of a cliche for it, it's almost like marking your own homework in a way. And you know, maybe there could be some tighter controls over how you assure yourself that things are being done. Um, but as an industry, I think we need to think about this last one. As an industry, we need to really consider that a lot of changes have been made over the years. And actually, while we've seen a drop in fatalities, there hasn't really been a massive drop in near misses. There hasn't been a massive drop in incidents. So it's certainly not got worse, but it's really not really got better. So despite a lot of initiatives from all over the industry, we're still seeing these kind of near misses occur. So as an industry, we've got a challenge there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about 019. Now, um, we've kind of dealt, we've seen 019 issue 9 um, issues before it's an incident we had at Southampton. Now Southampton is um, near Primrose Hill in London and there's this rather bizarre access point uh, where you kind of come down in the town foot which most most of the time you come in from the sides of the track so you come in from the slows or you come in from the fast. Here you come down the middle and essentially Cos got it wrong. Cos directed people onto the open lines which were the fast lines instead of the slow lines and some issues with local knowledge, some issues with unofficial work methods where there were kind of like three costs kind of multi um, running the job between them. Um, and the costs who directed people the wrong way had, you know, you didn't respond to a challenge very well. So lots of issues, but you can kind of see why in one one decision about whether left or right is the safe direction to go, all of a sudden you put people in harm's way. One of the things with this um, particular job that was, um, was that came to light from it was the fact that the, the pick role which had come in on issue nine hadn't really settled in to people's minds. People weren't really that aware of what it meant or how it was meant to be run. And really that pick role, which is so key to the kind of principles of issue nine, wasn't really that well understood at the culprit. Um, and we later found those same issues at Margaret where the, this kind of role of pick where you're combining the, the safety of the work site with the um, production of the work site almost. Um, and one role's in kind of intermingling those two responsibilities. People just really didn't get it. Um, so a challenge for Network Rail there, which we've made a couple of times now, and actually things are starting to improve there, which is sort of the next presentation, earlier, which is really encouraging. Um, one of the other things we've really been focused on through Mark is looking at staff behaviour. Now, this is another incident um, we investigated. This is at Egmonton. A lot of you, I'm sure, will have heard about Egmonton over the last couple of years because this was a really serious um, 125 mile an hour train on the East Coast Main Line. Um, this is the forward facing CCTV about two seconds prior to reaching where that work group currently are. Um, they were this was a work group consisting of a network rail um, cost pick and a team of contractors. And there was a power gradient here. The contractors didn't really want to challenge because they were afraid that they wouldn't get work the following day because the cost might just save some time to come back. Um, and so as safety and um, the safety discipline on site began to dwindle, no one felt enabled to challenge. And they set up this bizarre hybrid system of work where towers and lookouts were combined. It really wasn't a, a good place to be. Um, and then the lookout got distracted, got involved with the work. In a lot of ways, a lot of um, parallels to what we saw at Margaret with Edmonton. And going on with those behaviours of staff, we've kind of been looking in particular with Margaret at two groups of behaviours. So one is looking at team behaviour. So this idea of challenge, you know, but things like Cyrus, which we just heard from Kerry, fantastic tool to allowing people to challenge unsafe practices if they don't feel um, able to raise work safe, for instance, or if they don't feel able to challenge directly, they've got the route. Just people need to know about it and feel confident to use it. 
with. You see a lot of kind of, this is the way we've always done it. This is how we do it around here. That kind of mentality of we've been doing it for 20 years, it's always been okay. And so this idea that tradition and customer practice are, are kind of immutatable, you can't challenge that, is wrong. You know, we need to innovate, we need to get better. And Nick's presentation this morning showing that really challenging those norms and those ideas that this is the way we've always done. There's always going to be pressure to get the job done, fully understand that, but never should be at the expense of safety. But equally, you've kind of got a bit of a balancing act here because you've got, you have someone who's incredibly safe but doesn't get the job done, so you will never give them the job to do in the first place. Equally, you've got people who will always get the job done, but maybe they don't get it done safely. So you need to find the people who can balance those two things out well. Um, spoke at Edmonton about kind of permanent staff as contractors. We've seen a bit of that over the years. And all of those things combined, as we see people bending the rules a little bit, we see people taking shortcuts, we see a lot of people kind of doing um, things not entirely to the book. Very often only small digressions. And they can be, in some, some cases they can be harmless, in other cases they can be catastrophic. But it's not always malicious. People are often bending the rules for what they perceive to be the right reasons, for the reasons of getting the job done, for the reasons of being more efficient. We also need to think about our um, our safety leaders on site. Now, we've always had this role of cost. That's for as long as I can remember, I came into the industry around kind of the turn of the millennium and cost was just coming in then. And this idea that there's always someone on site who is in charge of your safety has always kind of been um, part of my control in that way. But with the, with the um, pit coming in, and that has come in as kind of uh, a legacy from Safe Work Leader, you've now got someone who's doing that balancing act between safety and production. Uh, getting the right people in these roles is going to be critical for the safety of our staff. And we, as an industry, we shouldn't be shy of being selective about the people we have. I've, I've worked with people who are a cost because they were high count before that and because they're the oldest person in the gang. They're fantastic gangers. They're fantastic track chargemen or track supervisors. They're not necessarily fantastic costs. We need to be fairly brutal and say they're not the right person to be a pick. And that can be difficult on occasions. As Nick's already alluded to, non-technical skills are going to be critical in all of this. Um, NTS was one of the key fundamentals behind the Safe Work Leader program. It kind of fizzled away a bit, but it's coming back in for the pick. I think that's going to be a really positive step for the industry because um, our safety leaders being adaptable, being open to challenge, our safety leaders being knowledgeable but also being willing to kind of adapt is, is, is going to only get us sort of a safer value. And so the selection and training of the right people in those roles is fantastic. But we also need to develop them so they can be better and we also need to retain them. So making sure we look after our safety leaders, making sure that we have the right people in our role and maintain the right people in our role. Now the last one, um, what we do sometimes see we've spoken about this in some of the focus groups, is over time, people's idea of what is safe and what isn't changes, and um, kind of the perception of risks change as well. Some people get more risk averse, but some people get a little bit more kind of risk tolerant. Managing the change in people over time is going to be critical. Um, I thought I'd put this in, in light of Margaret, I and mean, also looking at what Nick said earlier, and that is looking a lot of what we've looked at revolves around the use of lookouts. Um, roughly half, uh, just under half of um, track worker safety digests or investigations that RAOB have done are around lookout working. Um, now, that is a double-edged sword in a way. Lookouts we know is, is a very risky way of working. It's very prone to single points of human failure. As is Laos, which you'll see is responsible for one of the incidents there. Um, However, I will counterpoint it by saying that we've also had 20 out of the 46 jobs we've done where people and trains shouldn't be in the same place at the same time, and somehow they were. So, lookouts isn't the, you know, getting rid of lookouts won't be the end of the story. We've still got a lot of work to do. And the other thing Nick mentioned this morning is looking at additional protection, and hopefully, we, the reduction in lookout working will get rid of the red bit and the reduction of, and the introduction of um, additional protection for all line blocks will hopefully get rid of a lot of the green bit. Um, we will see 
Um, we're being, you know, maybe a bit of cautious optimism. We'll see. Um, the challenge I think we have as an industry is that the move away from lookouts is going to be a huge cultural shift, particularly to those who've been in the industry a long time. When we spoke to the staff in the focus groups, there's an awful lot of um, kind of uh, there a lot of staff saying, "Oh yeah, we know we can't do it anymore," but and there was that but at the end. And there's still a lot of staff out there who kind of still perceive lookout working as safe. I think Nick's presentation earlier shows that certainly the view from top down in network rail is that that isn't the case. Um, they do think it's a lot more convenient because you have the ability to go out with relatively little planning. Again, maybe not the place we want to be. And there's this belief that line blocks are very hard to obtain, or at least they can't be flexible in there. Well, yeah, you've got to be at that place at three minutes past two in the afternoon, otherwise you won't get it. Um, we need to challenge some of those um, conceptions that people have got, and we need to challenge them. So. If those are the kind of preconceptions people have in their brain, we need to give them good reasoned arguments why they are wrong or why they can do it in a better way or a safer way. The last one is a really a really difficult one to challenge, I think, and that is um, it's a personal thing. But one of the things that's come out again and again is that people trust their friends. And having a lookout who they know uh, very well stood next to them, they feel safer than trusting someone they've never met who's hundreds of miles from. Now, hopefully, using additional protection will kind of um, get people around this somewhere. But we've heard that message a lot, which is something I don't think people have really appreciated that mentality in the work. So, well, still some way to go, but I think from Nick's presentation earlier, I think we're seeing that actually we're hopefully making moves in the right direction. Um, the Margaret report put a number of recommendations out, mainly to know about, because obviously that's where we investigation was focused. Um, some of these are um, relatively procedurally based, but some interesting ones to look at. One, looking at a focus on people's behaviours and uh, bringing back those NTS skills. Um, you know, already inroads are being made in that, in that um, direction, which is good. Um, looking at the establishment of an expert group kind of sitting fairly high up in that world, but that has some permanency. Um, one thing we found with some of the things with Margaret was that people have chopped and changed jobs a little bit. In, um, and while we're not saying that there's been a, a, a memory loss in terms of corporate memory, there's certainly been certain fades in, in corporate knowledge. And so establishing some kind of oversight so there's some permanence into um, network else travel and uh, strategy going forward is going to be critical to ensuring continued improvement of travel and safety. Um, the, the next to last recommendation, I think, is a challenge to us all, and that is the industry as a whole needs to think about how we balance the need for an operation, operational railway with the need for maintenance access. And it's always going to be a balance because you've got tops and fox who are desperate for paths on the railway, and you've got maintenance organisations which are desperate for interventions. And balancing the two is going to be difficult because ultimately we probably need 30 hours a day rather than 24 that we haven't got in place. Um, so there's got to be some high level discussion across the industry um, to understand the best balance between maintenance and operation. Um, I appreciate there's been a lot to take in, there's been a lot to talk about. Um, one thing I will leave you with before we take questions is if you don't already, I'd really encourage you to sign up to our email alerts. Um, go to the website, there's a few places you can click to get to it. You've sent your email address, you get an alert. You can either set it to be every time we set something out or either a daily or a weekly kind of summary. Um, we investigate lots of different types of incidents. There's bound to be things which are relevant to the work you make. So I um, re really, really encourage you to do that. Um, and my email address is there if anyone wants to get in touch um, after the presentation. But um, thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a very thorough presentation. Um, I'm sure it has created a lot of interest. So let's see how we're doing for questions. Um, right. Okay, I've got quite quite a long question here from Kelly. All too often, we look to technology to provide the answers, but in my experience, the main issue is people. 
culture and behaviours. It is only when this changes can the safety metrics improve and get closer to zero. Improved technology assists, but this does not appear to be the answer. A cultural and attitudinal change is required and the individuals need to protect themselves better again rather than having the consequences. So it's, re it's really, I guess, a comment on a view, Johnson, that's being shared there by, from Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's a balancing act, let's be honest, because we, it would be foolish of us not to embrace new technology to better protect our people, but that's got to be done in conjunction with making sure that the right people are using it in the right way. So it's a balancing act between utilising new technology and ensuring that we've got the right people doing the job. Thank you. Uh, another a question now from Andy Franklin. You had uh, issues around planning as key. Planning safe systems of work is key, but I would like your thoughts on how we plan our work overall affects planning safe systems of work. Um, so I'm just trying to understand it. Let, let me just read it again. So planning safe systems of work is key, but I would like your thoughts on how we plan our overall effects planning safe systems of work. So, um, yeah, I think what, what Andy's saying is that having a good plan for the guys who go out on site on the day is critical. We, I think we all appreciate that, but there's a more strategic look at this. And that is um, some of the things that Nick spoke about earlier and some of the things which have come out in some of the other presentations is if we can keep boots off ballast, then um, we're going to reduce the risk because there are fewer people in harm's way. But also, if we've got to put boots on ballast, let's put them in at the right opportunities with the safest method that we can do, only doing the jobs that really need to be done. Um, and so there's got to be some kind of strategic look when we go on track. Now, um, L&E um, have been doing their safe and effective working exercise for a number of years now, and some of the interesting things from that are looking at when you can schedule work to when it's um, at its lowest risk. So when trains aren't running, how you can make um, different jobs on the same work site and do that safely. Some of the interesting things from safe and effective work are now being put in at a national level with the Nick Safety Task Force. And I think that's going to be a critical thing in terms of keeping people and trains in different places. Because ultimately, if we can do that, we're going to improve the safety. Thank um, you. Thanks, John. That's what Andy's getting. Thank you. So we've got uh, a couple of comments here from TNT. So he, he's quite surprised that you've actually only got five staff in the whole of the UK railways. No, um, no. That's five on call. We've got about 20 staff and there's a rotation. So um, right, okay, the, thanks for clarifying. It's normally 24 people um, and then any one time is either five or six on call um, to cover. So obviously it's about one week in three, one week in four. And I guess it might be a bit difficult to answer, Jonathan, but are you able to give a, um, a feeling of how long it takes to complete an investigation? Um, it varies depending on the complexity and the number of parties involved. Um, most investigations are completed in about 10 to 12 months. Some can be a little bit quicker. Um, Margaret, for instance, took longer, but there was um, a lot of consultation. There was a lot of work with families and there was an awful lot of work in the background of Margaret. So a particularly complex one like Margaret or the Croydon Tram and Sandylands might take a bit longer. Um, we had um, we had one looking at TSRs on the Cambrian. There's a lot of real technical detail that needed to go in there that had to go a long way back, so that took a bit longer. But most are 10 to 12 months. Thank you. So uh, now we have another question in from Dr. Brian Counter, and it's about people's perception of risk, which you did touch on on your presentation, Jonathan. And um, so in Brian's view, in his experience, sometimes people just look at a job um, to fill it and, and take a risk to fill it. You know, they've got a job to do to fill in the gaps and take a risk. So how can we better train people to understand and manage risk better? It's a strange world, isn't it? Because we've got a, I think a lot of us who've been in the industry quite a while have this perception that it's new people. You know, people who are fresh to the railway don't have the experience. I think one of the um, maybe sad realisations of Markham is that these were people who have been on the industry a very, in the industry a very long time. These are like the salt of the earth railway that we all, we've all worked with, we all know. Um, and it just shows that the perception of risk can be very different through your railway career. And the idea that new people are going to make mistakes because they maybe don't understand the risks, but over our railway career, do we become a little bit more complacent, a little bit more um, tolerant of the risks? 
and maybe we need to train people throughout their railway career for safety as opposed to bombarding people at the beginning of their career and then a lot of people can kind of just tick along. So maybe we need more interventions in people's training throughout their railway career to appreciate the changing face of the railway. Uh, because the railway today is very different from when I joined and I'm sure it's vastly different from when some of the people on the, on the call today joined. So kind of adapting to that change throughout people's railway careers is, is always going to be um, a challenge for us all. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Right, thank you. So that brings us to the end of the questions. So thank you very much, Jonathan, for that presentation. That was a um, very good way to finish the day, I think. Thank you. Thanks, and I'll just say a few, few words now before we finish. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, for their well thought out presentations on the subject for On Track for a Safer Railway. Just a few reflections really from those presentations today. We started the afternoon with a presentation from Nick, updating us on the track worker safety programme in Network Rail, which was sadly established following very serious incidents on site. Stephen then reminded us of the historical context and also gave relevant examples from other industries, um, reminding us that there are other places to learn things from. Um, Rob, Stuart, Gerhardt and Mick represented the views of the supply chain. We saw the Birds Triangle mentioned in a few of those presentations, um, reminding us the warning signs are always there if we choose to look at them. We also heard about particular considerations of working within the railway environment, for instance, electrification and how scary that can be, and working with plant. Our final two presentations from Kerry and Jonathan then gave the views of industry bodies. Cyrus, who offer a service that allows confidential reporting with the aim of making improvements, and Rabe, who independently investigate incidents and are another source of learning. And I know Jonathan was encouraging their people to um, have a look on the Rabe website. I have certainly used their reports in the past as part of safety briefings, etc., team discussions on safety. I find them very, very helpful. Uh, listening to all of the conversation today, it has reinforced the belief that safety is never, ever done. We have made significant improvements over a number of years, but there are still too many circumstances when things go dreadfully wrong. Hence, you know, the need to keep talking about it and learning from each other. The focus today has been on track worker and system safety, and I'd like to finish by giving the PWI a bit of a challenge. I'd like to see another one of these events but with more focus from those involved at the early stages of the life cycle. So clients, sponsors and designers, how do they ensure adequate consideration of safe by design in order to deliver an end product that meets the needs of the constructor and the maintainer without putting them at risk? So some, some food for thought for PWI colleagues. So that almost brings us to a close. And I just want to thank a few people as always. First of all, our sponsors, Volca Rail and Tracture. Without support from our sponsors, we could not run events like this. Um, secondly, I'd really like to thank the PWI London section. They were the people who pulled the agenda together, organised all the speakers, etc., um, which has been you know, such a, a breadth of subject matter all around safety. I think it's been really excellent. Um, and finally, I'd like to give special thanks to Kate Hatwell. So Kate is the person who helped us organise the logistics of all of this and, and getting us all practised to be able to present professionally in a professional manner today. So thank you, Kate, for that. Thank you all for attending today. Um, it's not the same as being together. You don't have time for the chat or with a cup of tea, etc. But it's great to see so many people attending today. So thank you. Just to remind you, the recording and the materials will be available on the PWI website soon. And as always, the PWI will be sending out a feedback survey. Um, can you please complete this? As we really do appreciate your feedback. It helps us to improve for the, the next event. And one last thing to say is just goodbye and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.